Hello, Om. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, I'll watch for him. Give us another one. Do we know if they're having trouble? Like, okay. I'm going to message Tara. So that's Michael Walters. I'll make him a panelist. Yes, I, I, as an attendee, yeah. yeah. Oh, so they'll come in that way.
Who, that was Councillor Hamilton, Kate? That was Councillor Hamilton, I made her a panelist. Yeah, I must have missed him, Kate. I think I just missed highlighting him on my sheet. I'm going to get that tag. Do you see Katarina okay. still can't get in? Katarina. We'll roll call in a minute. Just making sure. We're still missing a few speakers. Okay, stand by then. We'll uh, start the meeting in a moment once we've got some more of our speakers tuned up. McKean's having trouble now, too. Yeah, and I'll move them.
Hello? Councillor Katarina, have you joined by phone? I have. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. I'll keep trying the other one, but... Uh... To the clerks, how are we doing on uh, possible quorum and roll call? Are we getting close to be able to start? Hello, Katie. Can you hear us? Katie, could you try that again, please? Hi, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. We have 11 councillors by my count, and we are still missing a few speakers, but um, we will do our best to contact them and see if they'll be joining us or not. Okay. Just a task, can you hear me, Mr. Matt? Yep, I can. We'll do a uh, roll call in a second here, folks. Name? Sorry, could call in user seven. Please tell us their name. Someone just joined the call um, by telephone. Could you tell us your name? Hello? Sorry, my bad. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> okay, I think we've got enough to start, or we'll try anyway. So I'll call this uh, City Council public hearing for June 23rd, and this is the land use public hearing, not to be confused with the other non statutory hearings that are um, also continuing this week. So um, I'll call this meeting to order and acknowledge that we're uh, talking about land that is traditional Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the many Indigenous peoples whose heritage is mixed with this land and has been for centuries or even millennia. The Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Blackfoot and the Nakota Sioux peoples as well as of course this being one of the great homelands the Métis Nation as well. And so we will 
call forth uh, that uh, sense of history and diversity and uh, cooperation to um, work our way through the bylaws that are before us and the decisions uh, about our city that are before City Council today. Um, so I will ask now for, uh, actually I'll roll call and then we'll deal with the agenda. So I think uh, we'll start this time with Councillor Knack, who is here in person. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, Councillor McKean. I found my way here somehow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> and uh, well done, sir. Welcome. Uh, Councillor Nichol. Councillor Nichol. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Welcome. Councillor Piquet. Thank you. Got to unmute yourself, Councillor Piquet. Sorry, dear. Thank you. No worries. Welcome. Councillor Walters. All systems go, Captain. <laughs> Superb. Um, make it so. Councillor Banga. Councillor Banga, are you there? He hasn't been able to join yet. We're, we're working with him to try and get him on the line. Okay, we'll try to add him in when we can. Councillor Cartmel. Remarkably, I am here. <laughs> Superb. Welcome. Uh, Councillor Katarina. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Zadik. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Essinger. Present. Super. Councillor Hamilton. Present. Welcome. Uh, Councillor Henderson. I am here. Excellent. Okay, that's everyone but Councillor Banga. Has he been able to join us? <laughs> Councillor Banga, are you there? Somebody is unmuted who should be muted, but not hearing feedback now. So we'll, uh, we'll it's, uh, 12 is enough to get started. So I need a motion to adopt the agenda with replacement pages for uh, 322. Councillor Essinger, would you be so kind? So moved. Thank you. Seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Okay, are there any questions on the adoption of the agenda? Seeing none, then please vote on the adoption of the agenda with the replacement pages to 322. Yes. 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 We're still missing one vote, Mr. Mayor. Is it the Councilor Banga or out of the 12 who are present? Okay, we're still mis missing one. Do you know which? Just so I can invite. It's not me, is it? It may, it may not have unmuted, but I've said yes. Okay, we have all 12 now. Thank you. Display the vote, please. And that's carried unanimously 12 0. Protocol items, are there any today? Okay, not seeing any. Then I will briefly outline the procedure for today's public, public hearing. The clerk will call out the bylaws to be dealt with and I will call out the names of the people registered to speak to each bylaw. Next, council will select the bylaws that we wish to discuss and vote on any bylaws that have not been selected for discussion today. 
Council will then listen to each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate. And for each of those items, the administration will first provide an overview of the bylaw, and then members of the public will be invited to make their comments through the conference call system. Those in favor will speak first, followed by those opposed. Each will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer. However, attendees may wish to use a timer at home too. When the speaker is finished, however, please stay on the line as councillors may wish to ask you questions. After comments from the public, council may then direct questions to city administration. And after all of the speakers have concluded, the <laughs> chair will then ask each speaker if they wish to speak to any new information which arose during the public hearing. This process will require patience to ensure that anyone who does wish to address council has an opportunity. Thereafter, council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. The city clerk will have additional resources dedicated to statutory public hearings to facilitate communication with those participating in the statutory public hearing process. If you need their assistance, please contact them at the contact information provided in the reply to your registration. Okay. Um, I will now, uh, oh, here we go, work with the clerk to call the bylaws. First um, Mr. Mayor, before we do, um, we have had someone join by phone that may be Councillor Benga, if we could um, verify. Um, is there uh, an, a number that we can link to for that call? Or uh, somebody, somebody just joined the call, if you could identify yourselves. Yeah, by phone, and you're unmuted, so we should be able to hear you. This is Council Benga. Oh, I'm great! On. Super. Great. Thanks for thanks for uh, phoning. We're just getting to the um, calling of the bylaws, so you're just in time. Thanks. Okay. Um, go ahead, calling the bylaws, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, Charter Bylaw 19325, to facilitate the subdivision and sale of the southerly portion of the property to allow for general business opportunities with the CB2 zone and allow industrial business opportunities on the north portion of the lot with the IB zone, Armstrong Industrial? Yes, I have John Boudreau to answer questions only, and no one in opposition. Is John there? John Boudreau? Yes? The sonar indicates yes. Okay. Um, I'll take that as a yes from the clerks that uh, John Boudreau is on the line. Uh, okay. 3.2. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.2, Charter Bylaw 19328, to allow for a range of commercial uses along a major arterial roadway, Calgary Trail North? Yes, I have Kylie Metcalf to answer questions only from Coulter Dalton Wolanski LLP. Is Kylie there? Yeah. Great. Welcome. Next. Is, is there anyone to speak to item 3.3, Charter Bylaw 19321, to allow for industrial businesses and limited compatible non-industrial businesses, Prince Rupert? Yes, I have Marshall Hundert uh, registered uh, to speak in favor. Is it to speak or questions only if it's selected? Marshall, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Just to answer questions. Okay, questions only then from Marshall. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. No one in opposition on that one? Is there anyone to speak to item 3.4, Charter Bylaw 19331, to allow for the preservation and restoration of a desi designated municipal historic building, Delton Grocery, and allow additional <coughs> development on the site, Delton? Yes, I have Ryan Eidick to answer questions only from EINS and no one in opposition. Ryan, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Great, welcome. Items 3.5 and 3.6 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.5, bylaw 19329, amendment to the Central McDougall Queen Mary Park Area Redevelopment Plan, or item 3.6, charter bylaw 19330, to allow for the continued use of a community garden and for the future development of a pocket park, Central McDougall? Yes, I have Trent Portugal to answer questions only from the City of Edmonton. Are you there, Trent? Yes, I am. Welcome, and no one in opposition. 
Items 3.7 and 3.8 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.7, Bylaw 19326, Amendment to the Jasper Place Area Redevelopment Plan, or item 3.8, Charter Bylaw 19327, to allow for small-scale infill development, Britannia Youngstown? Yes, I have uh, Chris Davis to answer questions only from Davis Consulting Group. Are you there, Chris? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.9, Charter Bylaw 19332, to allow for a variety of low density housing types, Edgemont? Yes, I have Om Joshi to answer questions only from WSP in Canada. You there, Om? Yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. I have Jim Killo to answer questions only from Rohit Communities. Yes, good afternoon. Welcome, and I have Russ Stock to answer questions only, also from Rohit Communities. Are you there, Russell? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. And no one in opposition on that item. Is there anyone to speak to item 310, Charter Bylaw 19319, to allow for a variety of low-density residential uses, the orchards at Ellerslie? Yes, I have Elise Ann Shillington to answer questions only from Stantec Consulting Limited. Are you there, Elise? Hi, yes, I'm here. Excellent. Welcome. And I have Mike Yochim to answer questions only from Brookfield Residential. Welcome. And uh, no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 311, Charter Bylaw 19335, to allow for low-density residential development, Keswick? Uh Yes, I have Elise Ann Shillington again from Stantec, who we just heard from, and Chris Nicholas to answer questions only uh, from MLC. I assume Elise is still there. Chris, are you there? Chris Nicholas? Hasn't checked in yet? Or he's, are you on the phone, Chris? Yes, sir. Ah, welcome. And nobody in opposition on item 311. Next. Items 312 and 313 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 312, bylaw 19333, amendment to the Heritage Valley Town Center Neighborhood Area Structure Plan, or item 313, charter bylaw 19334, to allow for medium rise multi unit housing Heritage Valley Town Center? Uh, yes, I have Elise Ann Shillington uh, again, as previously recognized, uh, from Stanta Consulting Limited, uh, and joined by Yolanda Liu to answer questions only, also from Stantec. Are you there, Yolanda? Hello, I am here. Good afternoon. And uh, the previously um, noted Chris Nicholas to answer questions only from MLC uh, for this item. So, uh, and no one in opposition. Items 314, 315, and 316 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 314, bylaw 19297, amendment to the Lewis Farms Area Structure Plan? Item 315, bylaw 19298, amendment to the Rosenthal Neighborhood Structure Plan? Or item 316, charter bylaw 19299, to allow for medium and high density residential development, Rosenthal? Yes, I have Sarah Sherman to answer questions only from IBI Group. Sarah, are you there? Sarah did not check in. Okay. I have Catherine Shopko back to answer questions only from IBI Group. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Good afternoon. And do you know if Sarah's, uh, your colleague Sarah Sherman is going to be able to join us? Sarah is un unable to attend today. Okay. Um, noted, and thank you. And then uh, also on this item, I have PJ Pescod to answer questions only from Melcor Developments. Are you there, PJ? Hi, uh, yeah. Super. Yes, ma'am. Welcome. And no one in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to item 317, Charter Bylaw 19141, to amend Bylaw 14380, Arterial Roads for Development, to make administrative changes to Heritage Valley, Ellerslie, and Windermere catchments? Um, no, I have no one registered for that item. Do that's admin driven. That, that's admin driven, though. Okay, right. So admin can answer questions if there are any. Items three eighteen and three nineteen will be dealt with together. 
Is there anyone to speak to item 318, bylaw 19305, amendment to the Boyle Street Macaulay area redevelopment plan, or item 319, charter bylaw 19306 to allow for a mid rise residential building, Boyle Street? Yes, I have Alan Partridge to answer questions only from Next Architecture. Alan, are you there? Present, Mr. Matt. Great, welcome. And in opposition, I have Michael Brisson. Is Michael there? Yes? We do have Michael on the line and unmuted. Can you just say hello, Michael, and make sure we can hear you okay? Yes, hello. Fantastic, thank you, welcome. And we have Georgina Villeneuve as well. Georgina, are you there? Yes, I am. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so two folks in opposition on 3-8, uh, the Boyle Street, uh, Macaulay bylaws. Next. Items 320 and 321 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 320, bylaw 19230 to amend the Strathcona area redevelopment plan, or item 321, charter bylaw 19231 to allow for row housing Strathcona? Uh, yes, I have, well, actually I have nobody um, registered in favor. Um, and in opposition, I have Gordon Honey on behalf of Peter Theodore. Gordon, are you there? We have not been able to verify if uh, Gordon has joined us. There are a couple of people on the phone that, that we haven't been able to connect with, so they're unmuted right now. Gordon, are you there? Speak up if you are. Well, hopefully, uh, Gordon is able to join us by the time we get to that item. Um, I think Councillor Henderson intends to select it, if, if uh, would be my assumption. So um, next up is 322, the open option parking. Um, just for your reference, all those that have not checked in um, are being contacted directly by our office, so okay. we'll keep you posted. Great, thank you. Um, is there anyone to speak to item 322, Charter Bylaw 19275, Text Amendments to Zoning Bylaw 12800 for open option parking? Yes, I have Ashley Salvador from Yeg Garden Suites. Are you there, Ashley? Yes, hello. Welcome. I have Anand Pai from Naop Edmonton. Anand, are you there? Yes, hello. Welcome. I have Ann Stevenson from the Right at Home Housing Society. Are you there, Ann? Yes, hello. Welcome. I have Chris DeLaba from Belgian Development. Are you there, Chris? Good job. Yes, ma'am. Welcome. I have Michaela David from the uh, Urban Development Institute Edmonton region. Are you there, Michaela? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Welcome. I have uh, Mariah Samji from Infill Edmonton. Are you there, Mariah? Yes, I'm here. Welcome. I have uh, Yasushi Oki from the Green Violin Community Development. Yes, hello. Welcome. Uh, I have Adil Kodian from Canadian Home Builders Association Edmonton Region. Adil, are you there? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. I have Kirsten Goa from IDEA. Hi, I'm here. Welcome. Thanks. I have Katie Ingraham. Katie, are you there? You may be muted. Hi, I'm here. Great, and welcome. Just a friendly reminder to the participants um, on WebEx, our team here will mute and unmute you at the appropriate time, so there's no need for, um, for you to do that on your end. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Bob Summers, Dr. Bob, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Welcome. I'm here. Uh, and uh, uh, number 12 in favor is Matthew Hoyt. Matthew? We have not received confirmation of Matthew's attendance. Okay. Uh, and then in opposition, I have uh, Climate Tan. I am present, Mr. Mayor. Welcome, and uh, Marcel Husselak from uh, Belgravia Community League. I'm present, thank you. Welcome, Marcel. Uh, okay, so have we missed anybody? 
Not that I'm aware of. Or has anyone joined us since we did the call? Okay. Well, there's one or two people might along the way. Uh, we'll now select items for debate, uh, starting with Councillor Henderson. Uh, yeah, uh, in the hopes that um, that uh, the speaker arrives, I will do 320 and 321. Um, I think we've had a letter from them as well, though, so uh, that may help. Um, and 322, um, uh, I'll leave, uh, I'm guessing we need to do 318 and 319, but I'll leave those for Councillor McKean, unless he would like me to do them for him. Uh, I would have selected them either, but it, um, whatever, whatever is easiest. Okay, well, I'll come back to you, Councillor McKean, in a moment, but uh, Councillor Knack was up next. No rush. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just, I have very, very quickly, I need to 3738, and uh, then a quick question as well on, I think it's 314, 315. Those are both cross together. Okay, okay. so Councillor Knack has selected the uh, Britannia Youngstown uh, item and the Rosenthal uh, item, uh, which are 3738 and 314, 315 respectively, uh, 316 as well as part of that, so 14, 15, 16 are all cross-referenced. Uh, and Councillor Henderson has taken 320 and 321 as well as 322, and uh, I understand Councillor McKean, you'd like to select 318, 319? Please, Mr. Mayor. Great. Are there any other selections? Not hearing any, so I want to move. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll move closure of public hearing for all others. Okay, thank you, Councillor Katarina. Second. Seconded by one. Councillor Knack. Okay, uh, please vote. Oh, on just a uh, reference. Pardon me? Katarina? Yeah, no, I was going to read off the numbers, but we're fine as an omnibus. Uh, yeah, three one three two three 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 four three five three six. 39 through 313 39 and 317. And 317, yeah. Yeah, so that's the omnibus yeah. for today. Um, as uh, moved by yourself to close public hearing and seconded by Councillor Knack, please vote. Yes. Yes. We have 13 votes. Display the vote, please. That's carried unanimously. I'll move uh, first reading of the omnibus, Mr. Mayor. Second. First reading of the omnibus bylaws, please vote. Yes. Yes. We have 13 votes. Thank you. Display the vote. That's carried. I'll move second reading uh, of the omnibus, Mr. Mayor. Second. On second reading, please vote. Yes. Yes. We have 13 votes. Thank you. Display the vote. Carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, consideration for third reading on the omnibus. Second. To allow third reading to proceed on the omnibus bylaws, please vote. Yes. Yes. Display the vote, please. That's carried unanimously. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move third reading of bylaw 19325, 19328. 19321, 19329, 19330, 19329, 19331, Yes. We have 13 votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Display the vote. That's carried unanimously. Those items are passed. Thank you all for joining us. If you were here for those items, uh, have a great rest of your day. Um, however, we'll 
go now to the Britannia Youngstown item, then the Rosenthal item, then the uh, Boyle Street Macaulay item, then the Strathcona item, and then parking will be last. So bear with us if you're here for the parking item. Um, won't be too, too long, but um, it'll take how long it takes. So, Councillor Knack, did you want a presentation? On no, actually, Mr. Mayor, I, I just wanted to briefly speak to it. So, I oh, speaking no to it. Okay, does yeah, anybody so. else have questions on 37 or 38? Not seeing any, then uh, do you want to um, move to close public yes, hearing? Yes, I'm happy to move the closure of public hearing for 37 and 38. There, there wasn't really a hearing, so I don't think I need to call for new information. No. There's nothing to respond to, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> just, just checking, just checking. Thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. Okay, so uh, on closure of the public hearing, I Second. need a seconder for that. Uh, was that Councillor McKean? Second. Okay, uh, so to close public hearing on 3738. Please vote. Yes. Yes. We have 13 votes. Display the vote, please. Carried. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll move first reading of items 3, 7, and 3, 8. Seconder. Second. Thank you. Uh, so. Go ahead on first reading. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and sorry to, to thank you for your indulgence on this. Just being that there's an amendment to the ARP and knowing that the communities that are made up of that ARP always pay very close attention, even if they're not actually here registered. Uh, I wanted to note, I'll actually support this. I, I haven't supported um, pretty much any other amendment to the ARP. There are a couple of unique features and just briefly why I feel it's um, important to support this one, even though it doesn't absolutely perfectly align with things like the infill guidelines or the ARP. Um, this is within about two homes of a pocket park space in a block of the school and in the block it actually happens to be on uh, is also a little unique in nature in that uh, the homes on the avenue, there are a number of homes facing the avenue so it actually fits quite well with the overall aesthetic. So I just, I, I needed to say that out loud knowing that there are a number of uh, residents who often closely watch any um, adjustments to the ARP and I feel it was worth saying that out loud on the record here versus just in written form and emails or things like that. So uh, I think this is a good, good one of the, the few times I'll support an amendment to the ARP uh, for Jasper Place knowing the time and the effort that went into it. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. You are most welcome. Uh, any other comments? No, not seeing any, then uh, please vote on first reading of the Britannia Youngstown. Yes. Thank you. We have 13 votes. Thank you. And display the vote. That's carried. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move second reading of items 3.7 and 3.8. Second. second. Thank you. On second reading, please vote. Yes. Yes. We have 13. Display the vote, please. That's carried. I'll move uh, consideration of third reading on items 3.7 and 3.8. To allow third reading to proceed. Second. Thank you. To allow third reading to proceed, please vote. Yes. Yes. We have 13. Thank you. Display the vote. That's carried unanimously. And I will move third and final reading of bylaw 19326 and charter bylaw 19327. Second. On third and final reading, please vote. Yes. We have 13. Display the vote, please. And that's carried. Thank you. Uh, next, then, is the uh, Lewis Farms Rosenthal item. Did you want presentation on that one? No, I might have a, a question for one of the in favor folks. One of the applicant representatives. Yeah. Okay, let me just turn to the right page there. 
So uh, Sarah Sherman was not able to join us, but uh, perhaps uh, to Catherine Chopko Beck, and if she wants to defer to PJ Pescod, she can. So uh, go ahead on questions of the um, uh, first of Ms. Chopko Beck, Councillor. Thank you. Matt. Yeah, and this may be for Mr. Pescod. He might know for sure, but but uh, if, if feel free to answer whoever knows it best, and we'll transfer if need to. So there were just some questions about the uh, connection from. Rosenthal Way into 92nd Avenue, um, being that currently Rosenthal has no traffic lights to get out of the community. There are some significant traffic delays, particularly in the morning, to be able to turn out. And um, this development is immediately adjacent to Rosenthal Way and 92nd Avenue. And I have heard that that connection is supposed to be completed this year. And I wanted to just find out if, if anyone from the applicants could uh, expand on that. Thank you, Councilor Nack. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can. I can hear you. That's it, Mr. Pes Pescod. Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. I would like to uh, confirm that the be with this plan, actually, there would actually be connections to the second half, uh, and hopefully that would release some congestion that does come in uh, with those two entrances getting in, in and out of Rosenthal. Excellent. And sorry, and, and you were just cutting out a little bit, so I just want to confirm, is that connection, is at least one of those connections happening this year? Um, we do plan to move forward with this. We would need, we do have an, uh, a sale to proceed uh, within this stage, and we do anticipate it going forward. Uh, and so our intention is to absolutely build, uh, but if the sale does fall through, um, we may have to postpone it until the next year. But, but right now, the time move forward with it uh, right away. We have completed the grading work, um, and then the underground and surface work would come next. Okay, I think I, I think I heard that generally. So uh, it sounds like the, <laughs> most likely that's happening. So just correct me if I if I if I heard you correctly here. Um, so you had said there's a sales agreement. Assuming that goes through, the connection will be made this year. If it doesn't, there's a possibility that could be pushed out to next year. Is that what I heard? Okay, sorry, thank you. It's just you were a little, little um, uh, cutting in and out there. All right, so uh, I think that's all the questions. Uh, uh, maybe there would be an opportunity for you to connect with me when that time comes and the Community League, as there's been a lot of questions around that and, and uh, as you can imagine, an eagerness to see some type of connection to traffic lights that will allow them to not have to wait upwards of 15 minutes turning out of their neighborhood right now. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Those are all my questions for the applicant, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for the applicant? Questions for administration, Councilor Nack? Uh, I get. Uh, yeah. I guess quickly, just just on that traffic concern, uh, I wanted to ask it out loud. Uh, similarly, so we have is is that information the same information we have been hearing that since the, that that's been sort of the number one request from the community around having some type of connection to a traffic lights. Excellent. Okay. That's all I needed to hear then. Thank you. Um, that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'll move it when the closure at the appropriate time. Sure. Let me just check if there's any new information. Not hearing any, then go ahead on closure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move closure of items 3.14, 3.15, and 3.16. Second. Seconded by Councillor Katarina, I believe. Please vote on closure of the yes. public hearing. Yes. Yes. We have 13 votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, and uh, display the vote. That's carried. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move first reading of items 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3 and briefly comment on it. Okay. Uh, Second. Go ahead. Speaking to first reading. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And sorry, I just, just again, uh, knowing that this one had actually generated uh, some correspondence through our office uh, around concerns 
Um, just again, saying it out loud right now, the community of Rosenthal does have two access points out of the community, neither of which have traffic lights. And with the, uh, how far out they are built right now with the, the level of homes that are there, um, that has created a lot of congestion, particularly in the morning, trying to turn out of the community. So um, I had heard that this connection, which actually would, would greatly help the community, would be done this year, uh, pending what, what we had been shared earlier. So I'm comfortable with this, even though, yes, this is an increase in density, it's immediately adjacent to the future rec center site and a commercial site. So it makes a lot of sense that if we're going to increase density um, outside of what the approved neighborhood structure plan is, this would be a perfect location for that. And if we can, as long as we can address the traffic concerns, I think all will be well. So I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further comments? Not seeing any, then on first reading, please vote. Yes. We have 13. Display the vote, please. That is carried unanimously. I'll move second reading of items 3.14, 3.15, 3.16. Thank you. Second. Uh, please vote on second reading. Yes. I only heard one verbal uh, response, which would mean we have 12, but I may have misheard. Yes, yes. Um. Then that makes 13. Okay. Thank you. Display the vote, please. That's carried. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move third reading of those same three bylaws. Okay. Second. And yes. Do we need consideration? Did I say, sorry, I thought I said the word consideration. No, I must have not. Yes, I move consideration of third reading for those three bylaws. To allow third reading to yes. proceed, please vote. Thank you. Yes. Yes. We have 13 votes. Display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. And now I will move third reading of uh, that is bylaw 19297, bylaw 19298, and charter bylaw 19299. Second. Thank you. On third and final reading, please vote. Yes. Yes. We're just missing your vote, Mr. Mayor. Really? Well, put me down as a yes, please. That gives us 13. Display Thank the you. vote then. That's carried. Um, okay. That takes care of the Rosenthal item. Next up is 318-319, the Boyle Street uh, Macaulay ARP, mid-rise residential building. Um, uh, Councillor McKean, you'd selected this. Do you want a presentation on it? Yeah, actually I think um, I would. Well, and since we have speakers in opposition, I think it uh, it makes sense. Sorry, I was just on the wrong page there. So let's have the presentation, and then we'll hear from speakers and go from there. Mr. Ford, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor and Councillors. This is an application to rezone to allow for a six-story residential building within the Boyle Street neighbourhood. A proposed amendment to the Boyle Street Macaulay Area Redevelopment Plan also accompanies this rezoning application. The site is located on 91st Street, a dead-end street north of Jasper Avenue, and is surrounded by residential development of varying densities. To the west and north of the site are low-rise apartment buildings. To the east, the site is adjacent to a row house-style building and a high-rise apartment building. This site, for your information, has undergone a number of rezoning applications since 2008, 
including a proposal to allow for a 20-storey tower with over 100 units. However, each of these applications was subsequently withdrawn. Commercial and retail services are located on Jasper Avenue with Dawson Park across Jasper Avenue, which connects to the ravine system and a shared use path network. Frequent bus services located on Jasper Avenue and 95th Street. The property is currently occupied by two single detached homes. One of these houses, the West resident shown on this slide, is on the inventory of historic resources. A condition assessment was submitted by the applicant and reviewed by the administration prior to the review of this application, but it concluded that due to serious degradation and costs associated with remediating the building to a habitable standard, that the building should be demolished. The rezoning application proposes a DC2 site-specific development control provision to allow for the development of a 75-unit, six-storey residential mid-rise building. Due to the reduction in the expected parking spaces, this proposal also includes to subsidise transit passes for residents to offset the lack of parking compared to bar zoning bylaw minimums. Compared to other zones, this proposal falls between the RA7 and RA8 zones in terms of built form and density. The impacts of additional height and floor area ratio allowed under this DC2 provision are mitigated in large part due to its site context. The site is surrounded on three of its four sides by road right-of-ways, which act as a buffer to help mitigate the impacts of additional height and site coverage between this site and the existing surrounding development. The remaining eastern edge of the site shares a property line with an RA9 site where two towers and a row house are currently located. The eastern setback, shown on the slide in green, is the most important on this proposal due to the existing residential development. The proposed building will produce shadow and overlook towards the existing building during the afternoon and evenings throughout the majority of the year. Though not ideal, it's important to note that this similar shadow impacts will also be produced by a building that could be built under the current RA7 zone, with a maximum height of 16 metres. To mitigate the shadow and overlook impacts of the eastern property, the setbacks to the east is a minimum of 4.5 metres to keep the building further away from the adjacent building's rooftop amenity areas. The site is located within the Jasper East apartment housing sub-area of the Boyle Street ARP. The policies of this area envision future development of this area with apartment housing from low to high-rise apartments. While this application generally conforms with the policies of this sub-area, the ARP designates this site as being appropriate for low-rise apartments up to four storeys on the associated map for this sub-area. As such, an amendment to the land use map is required to redesignate this site to an appropriate six storeys. No policy amendments are required. With the increases in development rights, the application is required to provide affordable housing in line with policy C582 and community amenity contributions in line with policy C599. Both policies have been met and the application propose, proposes to provide two three-bedroom family-oriented units. The Edmonton Design Committee also reviewed this application on September 4th last year and provided support. A public engagement drop-in session was held in December 2019 to obtain feedback from the surrounding landowners on the proposal. Following the engagement session, administration received a notable volume of comments from surrounding landowners with concerns over the lack of parking provided on the site, as the original application proposed only five spaces. Following these concerns, the applicant revised their application to require a minimum of 42 on-site parking stalls, which is a substantial increase from the original five spaces. In addition, these spaces, to these spaces, the applicant is also, providing, uh, is also proposing to provide sub subsidized transit passes for residents to support the lack of parking provided. In closing, the proposed DC2 provision is appropriate for this location as it increases residential density on a site close to the downtown near the future transit network implements an innovative program for residents without access to traditional parking stalls with subsidized transit passes for residents and is compatible with surrounding context between land zone for high-rise development and low-rise development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now hear, uh, well, check to see if there are any questions for Alan Partridge. Are there any uh, uh, questions? I, I do have questions. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I do have questions. Go ahead. Uh, Please do. Uh, so is Mr. Partridge, I guess he's handy, isn't he? Um, so Mr. Partridge, I wanted to ask you first of all about um, 
you have changed the program for this building to include 42 parking stalls. Where, where are they? Do you have to go underground now? Yes, they are uh, fully underground. There is no above ground portion to the park. How did that change the pro forma for the building, the market you're hoping to go after that, the, the market affordability or whatever the program you have? Can you comment? Yes, it, it, it added additional costs. Um, and got us uh, above where we were targeting initially for the a preferred market rate. Um, but given that it is only one story, uh, from a constructability point of view, that is the least cost to go underground. As everybody knows, every subsequent level adds a factor to the cost. So we would have a portion of a basement underneath that, but would have preferred to do it as uh, zero parking. Uh, but in, given the pressures and on the uh, owner, uh, it was decided to add a, a level of parking. Yeah, I, and I totally understand how the committee has concerns about that. I get it. I can explain how a subsidized uh, transit path system would work uh, into the future. You could see the first round of residents coming in get a subsidized transit pass, but. How, how can we hold the owner to that in the future? Councilor McKean, I think um, that that is something that we still need to uh, sort out in detail with uh, with planning. The owner is committed to a subsidy. It makes abundant sense, and it makes these buildings considerably more attractive. Uh, the reality is, is that even with parking, unfortunately, to recoup the return on investment, uh, no parking store is not free. So the, there is some uh, work to do on that, and uh, we're fully open to uh, working with that administration to make sure that any questions or concerns in the perpetuity of it. So the other thing, um, Mayfair, uh, the building on 9th and Jasper has done some interesting uh, work with opening up their underground parking to the community. So uh, residents uh, can rent a spot, but they're not guaranteed a specific spot. Is that something, Mr. Parker, do you think you look at here to increase the inventory of parking spots in the area, yeah, given that you might not have everybody wanting a parking spot? That's a possibility, Councillor McKean. Thank you. I, I don't think I can hold you to that, but I'd really encourage you to look at that. Um, anything else, like the sun shadow, would you comment on those sun shadow concerns that, that um, um, administration mentioned? Because that would be the other, I suspect, the other area of tension for the neighborhood. Yes, the, the, um, we did it when we did the overlay on the sun uh, study. We looked at the additional con uh, contributing shadow that this development would bring, and it was considerably less. What had to be kept in mind is the building to the immediate east casts a massive shadow for a large portion of when you want the shadow, and you don't want shadow, which is in the winter months. Uh, given that it, you superimpose an RA7, we're not that much more higher uh, to such that the contributing shadow beyond uh, between the two options is not considerable in my mind. But it is a shadow, but we've kept the building profile such that it minimizes that shadow, uh, particularly into the, um, uh, the evening on the low rise. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I have no idea of my time. I didn't interrupt myself. You have 11 seconds. Mr. Partridge, uh, just a quick comment on the um, on timelines for this. Uh, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. Any thoughts on this might go ahead? Um, well, we're going to take advantage of the fact we're in a pandemic from the point of view that this building is an opportunity to fully explore digital fabrication at a very unique level. 
where we reduce on-site and increase off-site. So we're pretty excited about uh, getting this uh, going, and the owner has committed that with a favorable outcome today, uh, we will start rapidly to work through development permit and uh, demonstrate an opportunity to build differently in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Knack? No, no, sorry. No, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Mr. Partridge? No? Okay. Um, next, then, we will hear from Michael Brisson or Brisson. Feel free to correct me. No, that, that'll be excellent. Go ahead. Uh, my concerns about the added parking, which is 42 stalls for 75 units. Right now, we have a problem in the area with extra parking with the limited space that exists in the community with, with children, with crossing Jasper Avenue, with the school to the north. It's a very congested area already with back alley traffic access into most structures. I, I don't see how only 42 stalls that possibly could go out to the public if the owners don't choose to pay rent on them or buy them and try and explore parking outside for free. My huge concern is traffic and parking that is already at a premium. Is that uh, uh, all you've got uh, at this time, Mr. Brisson? I, I am happy with the concerns of the building, the, the shape that he's done to respect the building to the east. I realize that property is faced on three sides by back alleyways or alleyways with a minimal space to 91st Street, which has a minimal access off Jasper Avenue itself with the bridge that's in place for leaving that property. I just wondered if, yes, he has improved parking, but I don't think he's addressed the issue. Okay, well, I'll go to Councillor McKean, who uh, may have some questions for you and uh, um, some awareness on some of those points. So, Councillor McKean, go ahead. Thank you, and Mr. Brisson, I appreciate you uh, attending today. Um, so, is there any parking restrictions on the public curb in and around that area? Like, do we have power two-hour parking restrictions? Any metered parking, that sort of thing? Uh, in what area? Well, the area of the of the project on the on the side streets and streets Fair. north of Jasper Avenue in it around there. North of Jasper Avenue, yes, we have two hour parking. Yes, we have event parking premiums. Uh -huh. right. okay. The only parking that that building would face to the to the east on 91st Street is very limited parking already. With driveway, the you know, personal I, properties are off in the road. I agree with you. No developer should be able to rely on the public curb for uh, his own residence. So that's where I'll be asking questions of administration or the parking program there right now and how that might be enhanced. And then uh, I'll continue to talk to Mr. Partridge and the owner about using his underground parking, perhaps to capture some of the demand in the area as well. So I, I hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think that's it for Mr. Brisson. Thank you very much again for coming in and thanks, Mr. Mayor. You're most welcome. 
Uh, any other questions for Mr. Brisson? No, I'm. I, I hope that's heard echoing because of safety issues. Sorry, uh, sorry, Mr. Brisson. I was just checking to see if any of the councillors had questions for for yourself. But I, you. I'm not hearing any. So if anything else comes up, though, during the hearing, there'll be an opportunity for new information. So, um, so thank you. We'll now hear from Georgina Villeneuve. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Georgina Villeneuve, and I live at 59026 Jasper Avenue. It's a townhouse directly adjacent to the proposed project. Um, my husband attended uh, Mr. Carlisle's presentation on December 10th concerning the, the proposed Boyle Street project. For this, we received an appropriate notice in the mail. At this time, Mr. Carlisle assured my husband that we would receive proper notice when the hearing was to occur so we could complete any research and repair for the hearing. In respect to today's hearing, we only found out about the meeting by chance meaning we saw the notice on Jasper Properties Community Internet site on June 15th. That is six business days notice. I certainly do not feel this is sufficient notice to do research or even a petition. But lastly on this point, I understand that failure to provide proper notice opens this hearing to judicial review. Um, I have uh, several concerns uh, for but for the record, I'm not against the development. I'm against detrimental development to a neighborhood that currently struggles with our fair share of break-ins, drug use, and homelessness. Today, I have six brief points that I will speak about. Um, I have reviewed the sun shadow studies and note that we will only have sun until noon and then be in the shadow the rest of the day in the evening. Um, well, that the developer may not feel that's necessarily bad for someone who only has a small patio in the backyard to get out and enjoy the sun, it is very detrimental. Um, at the presentation on December 10th, uh, we were told there was no parking included um, in the project. Today, I'm learning that uh, there will now be 42 parking spots now, uh, uh, 33 residents uh, will not have parking spots. Um, I know that the plans that are that people are supposed to use bus passes or walking or biking, but we all know that's not the case. That's not going to happen. Biking is fine, but we are a northern city, and most people put their bikes away in October for several months. The nearest grocery store is a 20-minute walk away. Coming back loaded with groceries in January for a family would be a tough slog if you ask me. Giving everyone a bus pass for three years does not do anything to alleviate this situation. Let's assume that there will be 33 cars added to the area because of this project. I have walked the area and 33 cars would take up all the parking space in the surrounding three or four blocks. There are very few open spots on the street on any night. So adding 33 cars would cause a parking nightmare. As I stated, I live at 9026 Jasper and we have 14 visitor parking spots on the north side of our property that are outside of our gates. We already have problems with non-residents using parking spots during stadium events and weekends. This situation will become a lot worse with all those extra vehicles looking for parking. Temperance will heat up over this and we will see more tows and police calls. Finally, let's be realistic here. Well, people buy cars and uh, people will be buying cars and will be looking for parking. Anyone who believes otherwise is just, um, is not really being realistic. The home on the property, um, the home on the property is one of the few remaining Queen Anne homes in the city and is recognized by the Edmonton Historical Board. Yes, it is in poor repair, but that has happened under the current owner's watch. It is really unfair for him to let the property fall apart and then say, hey, the place is falling down, let's bulldoze it. You know, in my opinion, that's pretty self-serving. And from what I've understand in the research that I've have been able to do in the last 24 hours, I understand that 
the council is sort of trying to revitalize the boreal area and bring families in for long periods of time. This project's not going to bring families in to the boreal area. This type of housing will encourage, encourage transient tenants, Airbnb operations, and neither, which fits the, the community feel. I want to make one point. I can sympathize with the developer owner of the property trying to make a buck on their investment. However, it seems that they are trying to fall a lot of costs off in the city and the community. The developer owner is passing all the parking costs on the city. We also, um, he is also saving costs by building this place on the cheap instead of putting in units where people can actually live for a longer period of time. Those uh, with kitchens, full kitchens and parking. Seriously, no family and few couples would ever move into a unit without the ability to park. The owner knows they cannot build a proper group of units here that are in line with the development of community values um, that the city is trying to encourage. The property is just too small. So they try to shoehorn this project in there with very little regard to the people already living there. Um, I want to thank you for the time. I would really hope that you would vote no, especially given that we're hearing today, well, you know what? No, we're going to have 42 parking spots now. And while well, there's still going to be 33, and maybe Thank we you. can park. Thank you, Ms. Villeneuve. Thank you, Ms. Villeneuve. The five minutes is up. However, there are questions for you from Councillor McKean. Go ahead, Councillor McKean. Uh, Georgina, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Um, you just listed... Uh, a number of concerns, and it's a little hard to deal with them all in five minutes. The social disorder, uh, crime, petty crime, we're working on it, believe me, but it's a difficult thing. Is the parking the number one issue for, for you? For me, it's the parking and the type of, of property that, that the owner is, is proposing. Like, I... Don't get me wrong, I'd like to see a development there, something nicer, but you know, to me is, is, is he's trying to make a dollar at the cost of the community and the cost of, of the city. So Fair enough. The, the, I don't think it's going to be good. The, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because I think the last, oh, I don't know, 10 or so, um, density projects we've seen, whether they were towers or mid-density like this, have all been uh, rental. And actually, we can't, we can't decide on <clears throat> zoning on whether or not it's rental or ownership anyway. So but that's been uh, going on. So the parking thing, you know, I wanted to get at, so if we have the proper um, controls in place, like, I, again, I don't think the developer should be able to use the public curb to subsidize his, his project. I'm very uh, adamant about that. But, I'm, you know, so he's taking a risk, in my mind, by not having a parking spot for every unit. And as long as we can fulfill uh, our responsibilities to make sure that he can't um, use the public curb um, um, unreasonably, for his residence. So comment on that, please. I, I'm, you know, Councillor, I, I'm quite confused as to how you would control this situation. How do you say to me as an individual, I don't have a right to go out and park the car, or purchase a vehicle and park it in the car, you know, on the street. And in this day and age with, you know, families where you have both a husband and wife working, Maybe the husband is working, you know, down in the south end and the wife is working in the north end. It's quite possible that you're going to have to have two vehicles. We see it right here in Jasper Properties. There's never enough parking in or underground and every unit owns one or at least two parking spots. So mm -hmm. assuming that you can control this is impossible. Well, um, the only thing I would say, Jordan, Gina, I'm... I'm a bit of an old guy, and uh, the way it was for me and my generation, I totally agree with you, but things are changing, and people are using public transit 
I like and car share and Uber and all these things a lot more. So I guess my uh, last question comment to you would be that we hear you. And I'm going to ask questions of administration as to how we would prevent this project and the owner of this project to sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, uh, allow residents to exploit the public curb when he's not providing parking for all those spots. So I want to turn the risk back on the proponent to say, you're going to have to rent those units without a parking spot stall. And, and we've heard of other situations where buildings are actually over parked now that they actually have arcades with a lot of empty stalls in them. So maybe that, you know, that would be proof to me that the way uh, my generation did things is changing. So, so uh, let us try to deal with this in, and I'll ask questions on your behalf of our administration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Ms. Villeneuve? Not seeing any, then what we'll do now is turn our gaze to uh, city planners um, for questions. Councillor McKean, go ahead, I presume. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm a little bit, I, I, I don't know, the sun shadow thing is, is challenging, especially in the urban core, where I don't know how we can guarantee a number of hours to anybody when there can be towers go up. Is there, any, is there any comment on that, on how we look at sunshine and the rights to X numbers of, of, of well, X numbers of hours of sun a day, given an urban context? Councillor McKean, no, there, there isn't any um, one rule that we go by. We do look to try and mitigate it as best as we can. Um, I think in this context, when there right. are high-rise buildings, RA9 sites around there, there's uh, existing mature vegetation. There's a whole variety of factors that um, produce shadows throughout the day at different times. Um, so to, to answer your question, I guess there, there isn't any great one rule that we use, but we do try to mitigate it wherever possible. I think to add, Councillor McKean, uh, the, the proposed application uh, has a very similar height to the existing zone of uh, 18 metres. The existing zone is 16 metres. To add to that, there's an additional right. setback on the east, uh, which is greater than the current zone, which helps that sun shadowing. So, and I think I want to ask parking, and this will come up more and more, certainly in... Um, the ward I represent and the ward uh, Councillor Henderson represents and others, can we, are we at a, a level now, are we sophisticated enough where we can um, put in place parking programs that ensure a good turnover of parking for the existing residents who want to have a dinner party and have people come over and visit, but we, we don't allow a, a developer to use the public curb essentially as a parking lot for his project when he's not providing all those stalls. I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Saeed to address those questions. Thank you. Councilor McKean, um, just to clarify first uh, that uh, there is a residential parking program in place around uh, 91 Street and uh, Jasper. Um, and there is some uh, restricted parking close uh, to the school. Um, that program was put in place back in the days when uh, most of the area was single-family residence, and uh, uh, we do understand uh, that uh, over time, um, uh, quite a lot of redevelopment has occurred. So uh, moving forward, uh, that parking program is um, uh, currently under review and uh, the potential for that to be dismantled and uh, uh, improvised uh, is, is there. And uh, we do have confirmation from parking service that they are looking into it. So Mr. Saeed, what I'm gonna get you to nod, if, if what I'm hearing from you is the parking program in there right now is dated. It's That's under correct. review and, there, and there'll be changes coming. That's to correct. Reflect the, to, to reflect the status quo plus the addition of these units. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Um, Mr. Mayor, I think those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Uh, yeah, I have, and I realize this, this may be water under the bridge, but I, there's a process question here about the Heritage Building that I wouldn't mind to for a little bit um, because what we have to report, not done by us, um, but done by, by a consultant for the applicant that tells us the building is, uh, is derelict and not fixable. We don't have any report on the importance of it from our Heritage people. Um, I'm guessing when a demolition permit comes in, we'll get a we'll get something from you giving us all that information and asking us what do we want to do about it, but that'll be a little bit after the fact. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't just mind a little bit more information about, about the building, and I, and I think it raises an interesting question of, you know, we keep on doing this. So we allow buildings to get so derelict that we have no choice but to, say, tear them down, and that's been a longstanding issue in the city. So I, I, I guess I have a larger question about it, um, that I think now is the time to ask rather than us asking when we get when we get the letter saying something on the list is asking for a demolition permit. Uh, Councillor Henderson, um, our heritage group did review this and, and did accept the findings. Uh, I believe they've been on site and they have looked at it and they, you know, the building is in such poor repair that um, I think they, they did realize that it was it was probably beyond repair and would cost way too much to, to bring it back. So we, we we have looked at it, and I think we've accepted the findings. Okay. I, you know, I think for future information, it would be useful to have that, you know, better spelled out in the report. Um, only, you know, there's a cart before the horse problem here because, you know, we're going to get a report that tells us how important or unimportant the building is that will get triggered by the demolition permit. And, and I, I think it would be way more useful, you know, when we do these rezonings, we, you know, we, we – and I've seen this happen elsewhere um, where, where we create an inevitable answer. Um, so there's something in our process here that just seems a little bit backwards, that's all. Um, so it would be useful to have in future as part of this report perhaps a more thorough analysis of the importance or lack of importance of the building rather than getting it in X amount of time when a demolition permit is applied for. So is there a way to, is there a way to look at that so we can at least understand more um, about the importance of these buildings at the point where we may be signing their death knell by rezoning? Councillor Henderson, we can certainly take that, that advice and start including it in our reports, and I think that's a point well taken by ourselves, and we will do that going forward. Yeah, because we're going to see that report anyway. We'll see that report as part of the next stage, but it'll be even more down. You know, if we, we decided we wanted to do something different at that point, it would be too late. Or it, would, it wouldn't be too late, but it would be it would be easier to answer that question for ourselves now. Great, thanks. Those are my only questions because I, you know, I know the building, and I, you know, I think um, there's no question it's one of those buildings that you know has has import and will be a lot. Maybe no way to say that, but I want to ask those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions for? Administration. I'll just check to see if there's any new information that's arisen during the public hearing that anyone wishes to address. All those uh, public speakers should have the opportunity to unmute themselves given their current status in the meeting. Okay. Well, if there's no further information then, uh, nothing under new information, then I will go to Councillor McKean. Oh. Yeah, sorry, I will move uh, closure of the public Q ring on items 318 and 19. Second. Seconded by Second. Councillor Knack. Okay. Please vote on closure of the public hearing. Yes. Yes. We have 13 votes, Mr. Mayor. Let's play the vote, please. That's carried. First reading, Councillor McKean. Yeah. Uh, I'm working through these uh, technical difficulties. 
Uh, I'll uh, move first reading on those two items and speak briefly. Second. Thank you. Um, go ahead, uh, speaking to it, Councillor McKean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I, we have had a number of previous proposals on this site, including a 20 story tower, as was previously mentioned. Uh, relative to that, this is a much more modest build, uh, certainly fits within that missing middle um, that we've been uh, really wanting to see more of in in uh, the greater downtown, I'll say. So that is certainly in its favor. The owner and Mr. Partridge originally had proposed building with only six, um, I think it was six uh, visitor parking spots, and it was a radical proposal. And I know that people in, in that neighborhood were really concerned. So we have a underground parking for 42 stalls. And to me, it's incumbent now in the city to follow through and develop a parking program that holds the owner uh, to his commitment, if you will, uh, that he's going to try to encourage people to use transit instead of cars. And I think we could do that. Our parking programs are much more sophisticated than they've been, and our ability to enforce is much more sophisticated than it's been. And um, I would add that the sun shadow thing is trouble, but in the urban core, it is going to happen time and time and time again. So it's 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 a really difficult thing to say hey, we would. I would oppose a project on that alone, and I, I just want to add, add quickly that I hear Councillor Henderson and his concerns, and it may be that he and I should uh, put our heads together afterwards and come up with a motion or an inquiry on this very matter so we don't get a, we don't have to make a decision on a rezoning and have this issue for us of heritage building at the same moment. Anyways, but uh, I will be uh, supporting this project. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak from members of council? Not seeing any, then please vote on first reading. Yes. Yes. We have 13. Display the vote, please. And that's carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll uh, move second reading uh, of those two items. Thank you. Second. Second reading, please vote. Yes. We have 13. Okay, display the vote. That's carried unanimously. I'll move consideration of third reading on items 318, 319. Second to allow third reading to proceed, please vote. Yes, yes. We have 13. Display the vote. That's carried. Mr. Mayor, I will move third reading of Charter Bylaw, no, sorry, Bylaw 19305 and Charter Bylaw 19306. Second. On third and final reading, please vote. Yes. yes. We have 13. Display the vote. Carried. Thank you. Um, next up is uh, the Strathcona item, 320 and 321. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mayor, um, our office has reached out to Mr. Honey um, by phone and by email, but have not heard from him uh, at this time. Okay. Um, Councillor Henderson, did you still want to uh, 
get the presentation on the item and work through it? Do you have questions? I don't need the presentation. My understanding is there is someone now registered uh, to answer questions. Um, so I, I do have, a, I have an email from Mr. Theodore, so maybe I can cover this by asking questions, asking those questions of the applicant, because I think there's just some more detail that they were wanting. Okay, stand by for just a moment then. Let me double check uh, if we have an additional speaker registered then. Do the clerks have uh, someone registered in favor? We do. There was a clerical error, but we do have a Ryan Edick for uh, in favor. Oh, Mr. Edick is, is for this item. Right, you did send me a note to that effect. I apologize. So, uh, um, Councillor Henderson, you can uh, ask questions of Mr. Edick then. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, thanks, uh, Mr. Reading. I So I, I, you know, I have an email from Theodore that I think, um, uh, I think part of what he was wanting to know and understanding we're basically approving standard zoning so that there, you know, you're not bound, you're bound by the zoning. But I, think, I think what he was interested in doing a little bit more about what your more specific intentions are, um, how parking would be handled, uh, and those kind of things. So I'm wondering if you have those thoughts right now that uh, that might be able to answer some of his concerns. Uh, hi, yes, I'm sure you worship Councillor Henderson. Thanks for the questions and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, we don't really have plans right now. Uh, unfortunately, we, we wanted to go to a standard zone for townhousing. That's really all I can tell you at this point. Um, specific yeah. design, okay. we don't have any at this point. Um, I can answer specific questions about why we chose our five, but design-wise, we don't have well, I guess that was my other question is because our, you know, I think you probably, understanding that our four, which is what it's currently zoned at, would, you probably could have done something similar, but you would have had to have separate buildings and not being able to do a kind of townhousing. But RF3, you could have done townhousing. So the rationale for going for RF5 instead of RF3? Yeah, the rationale for RF5 instead of RF3, I mean, the biggest one was, and sorry, I'm just looking off screen here, my, my rationale. Um, was the, the minimum rear setback. So uh, our intent is to consolidate all four of these lots. And as a result, that would make the front property line uh, 105th Street rather than 87th Avenue. So our rear setback in the under the mature neighborhood overlay for RF3 makes it 40% of the depth, which means a 20 meter setback from that Western property line. That's a little much in our opinion. So uh, that's why we chose the RF5 zone because there's only a seven and a half meter rear setback rather than that percentage based one. Um, and I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention also you get 5% extra site coverage and the one extra meter of height. So um, you, you just get to do a little bit more in RF5 than you would RF3. So in saying that it normally it would still front on the whole thing because it was consolidated would still normally front on 105, but in reality I'm guessing that's not what that's not the way you would deal with the site. You would you would it would it would front along I, I don't know how you could get in that number of units if your front was on 105. So that's more about the the, the normal situation than it is your intention I'm assuming. Yes, that's right. And, and I think that's a good point too. Like, because we'll have to, um, because we'll be fronting onto 87th Avenue regardless, there will probably be variances required regardless. So, um, although the, um, the letter that you received, he's, he's not here today, he will have other opportunities once we have specific designs in place to go the permitting process. So, um, he, he's welcome to have a look and appeal at that point if he's still has Okay. No, and that's what, and I did write that back to him. So, um, and then, and then the, the other question that I think he had was, you know, the parking is limited in the area. There's no question about that. It is a somewhat unique and ironically, we're going to have a discussion about parking coming up later, but, uh, just, you would have to park off any parking you provided would have to be allocated because it's part of the MNO, correct? And that seems to be your intent. That, that's our intent. And that's, uh, we had a pre-application meeting already with the city and that was what their message was to us as well. Um, we met with transportation about front access is off of 87th or 105. They said no. So yeah, everything will be off. That's, that's a non-starter. Yeah. Obviously that should be a non-starter. Okay, great. Cause the MNO wouldn't allow that. I think, I think that for the most part, um, answers, answers the questions as I understand from Mr. Theodore. It's unfortunate he couldn't come and ask himself, but thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Eidick? Okay, not seeing any. Then um, has Mr. Honey been able to join us? No, we still have not uh, been able to contact him. I have confirmed with our 
our staff upstairs as well that they are still trying. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, if every opportunity has been accorded for the individual to join the meeting, I think you're safe to proceed. Okay. I, I hope so, but uh, safer to check with you. So with that advice, um, let me loop back and see, Councillor Henderson, do you have questions for administration on this one? Just, I think just for, you know, again, uh, to try and do justice to the concerns that Mr. Theodore has asked me by email, I, you know, I think I probably should ask a couple of questions of administration. So, um, I mean, I guess to ask, Administration's thoughts on the same question, you know, the, the, the difference between doing an RF3 here and an RF5 and your thoughts about what those changes and differences would look like? Councillor Henderson, the way, the way we reviewed it, there was uh, a minimal difference really between the two. Um, there was obviously additional height um, with the RF5, but uh, overall it was, yeah, it was very that's comparable. About, that's about a meter, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, but things like access would have to, would, you know, essentially, you know, to make this work with town housing, it will really have to face the avenue, although maybe could hook around on the corner. So, so you actually, you might want it to face and have the, the final unit face, face the street. Um, those are the kind of things that we, we, that would already be expected out of the zoning. Because of the MNO, the parking would have to be from the rear, correct? We wouldn't allow it. Correct. Actually, from either the street or the or the avenue, correct? That is correct. Okay, and the number of units is marginally different. So it, this just allows you, it, it, this this really just allows for a little bit more leeway in terms of actually. I mean, the R five is more intentionally built to allow for a kind of town housing form as a zone. Yes, Councillor Henderson, we we thought this was an ideal site. This is but it's not quite as intentional, correct? Correct. Yeah. Uh, and it's and it and it, ironically, when we've looked at our problem with, with it being a flanking condition, which does create concerns, but although nominally this will be considered a flanking condition, in reality it won't be. Um, so some of the things with overlook and those kind of things that we would usually that we've had in the past with some of our R five conversations, because this essentially runs along the block face, uh, we wouldn't have those concerns, correct? That that is correct, and that's that's our hope and expectation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Those are my questions, and I'm really sad that uh, Mr. Theodore couldn't be asked, able to ask himself for himself. But I think, you know, in reality, I'll, you know, I think what he really wanted was more detail, and I realize that you just can't get that out of a standard zone. So, um, thanks. That's very helpful, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for administration on the Strathcona item? Any new information? I'd be prepared to move closer to the public hearing then. Okay. On uh, on uh, 320 and 321. I'll second that because I love row housing. I mean, yeah, no, the hearing's closed. I can. Well, no, we better vote on it before I express any sort of a strong feelings one way or the other about a particular form. Please vote. Yes. Yes. And uh, we have 13 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Okay, the public hearing is closed. Councillor Henderson, you want to move first reading? I will move uh, first reading of uh, 320 and 321. Um, and. Um, I'll second that. Yeah, and then I may speak to it very briefly. Go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I understand, you know, I think there are some differences here, but I, I think this is a really good, you know, I, I think it, I think it is in the context of the area. I think this is, I think town housing um, is a really good form um, for a neighborhood like this and, and seeing uh, the assembly of these, this kind of lot, I think actually really creates the opportunity to do it right in a way that will only be benefits the neighborhood. Um, you know, I'm aware that in other parts of this community where it was supposed to be townhousing, we couldn't get it because it got zoned up from that. Um, so I was I was really pleased to see this application come forward, and hopefully it'll it'll create a really good example of of, of what can be done with with well designed townhousing. So um, I mean, obviously, you know, for a community, it's always a bit more reassuring to know exactly what something is going to look like. But um, 
and creates the kind of protections. And uh, if, it, if it does happen from that, then there will be a chance for the community to weigh in again. So um, I'm uh, hope, looking forward to see this happening. I think it's the kind of project in the right place um, that hopefully we'll see more of. Thank you. Um, Councillor Knack, if you could take the chair. I've got the chair. Well, for all those reasons and for a love of row housing and the considerable work we've done on these um, so-called missing middle zones uh, to make them more buildable in consultation with uh, both community and, and builders, I think this is a good place to to uh, try this. And, um, uh, and and I think it will fit, knowing that block pretty well, uh, it, it will it will fit well with the scale of what's around there and provide um, a relatively speaking more affordable option through the efficient use of land uh, than the um, fairly monstrous uh, duplexes um, next to next to them, which so the scale of this will be comparable. Um, but uh, I think the additional height does make a difference uh, to the buildability and the additional uh, density in terms of the unit counts uh, and the, the unit per area makes makes for um, affordability in the use of the land. And I think if we can help this uh, form take off, then it will allow uh, more different kinds of families with different sorts of income levels to have the opportunity to live centrally, uh, live a more um, car optional lifestyle or at least less car dependent um, in uh, in a great neighborhood that I think will be made stronger by these 10 households um, uh, built according to this form. So um, I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, really excited to see this application. I'll return the chair. Thank you. Anybody else? First reading, please vote. Yes. Yes. We have 13 votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Um, I will move a second reading of uh, 320. I'll second that. Oh, 321. Thank you. Please vote on second reading. Yes. Yes. We have 13. Display the vote. Carried. Consideration. Um, I will move uh, consideration of third reading, 320 and 321. To allow, I'll second that. And to allow third reading to proceed, please vote. Yes. We only received one verbal vote. I believe it was Councillor Katarina, but I could have heard that incorrectly. Yes. Thank you, we have 13. Display the vote. That is carried. And I will move third reading of bylaw 19230 and bylaw 19231. Second. Please vote on third reading. Yes, yes. We have 13. Thank you. Display the vote. That's carried unanimously. Okay. Congratulations, Mr. Attic. You're free to go, unless you're sticking around for the parking item, which is our last uh, item of business for this meeting. A reminder that when this public hearing is complete, we'll take a short recess and uh, roll into the council meeting um, if, uh, if it's not too, too late. Uh, there might be a cutoff time for that. I'm going to talk with the city manager about that. Uh, we do have uh, possibly two items to deal with uh, still on that other meeting, so stay tuned. Um, let's get the presentation, since we've got lots of speakers uh, from multiple perspectives on Charter Bylaw 19275, Text Amendments to Zoning Bylaw 12800 for Open Option Parking.
Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Trevor Illingworth. I'm the senior planner for the zoning bylaw team. In May 2019, and then again in January of this year, administration brought forward reports to Urban Planning Committee recommending that minimum parking requirements be removed from the zoning bylaw and that Edmonton move towards an open option parking approach. Open option parking would allow homeowners and businesses to decide how much on-site parking to provide based on their particular operations, activities, or lifestyle. In January of 2020, Urban Planning Committee endorsed the proposed move to open option parking and directed administration to return to City Council public hearing with bylaw amendments. Edmonton's on a path of transformative long-range city building projects from Connect Edmonton through to the City Plan and Zoning Bylaw Renewal Initiative. Parking is very land intensive and getting the right amount of parking on a site-by-site -site basis can have a significant influence on our ability to realize the vibrant, compact, and walkable Edmonton envisioned by our long-range strategies and policies. Today's discussion is part of a 10-year conversation on how parking is regulated and provided. Over this time, parking regulations have been reduced and even removed in certain areas, such as in the downtown. Open option parking is the next step in that progression. Beginning in 2018, administration undertook a comprehensive parking study that looked to understand Edmontonians' values and priorities with respect to parking, as well as to analyze Edmonton's parking supply and demand. Through this study, administration found that demand for on-site parking really boils down to mode choice. For any mode choice, the main, uh, the main decision points are time, cost, and convenience. People balance these three factors every time they take a trip, considering the purpose and importance of the trip and the value that they place on their time. For a lot of people, a vehicle's cost, maintenance, and wear and tear are not factored into each trip. Instead, considerations such as the price of gas, availability of parking at the destination, and whether that parking is free are the primary influences over whether one will drive. Additionally, demographic factors, business type and popularity, and specific location within the city all influence parking demand. A technical study was completed to examine this. The study looked at whether the variation in parking demand could be explained by measurable factors that the city can regulate or control, like access to transit or population density. The analysis found that there was virtually no correlation between parking util utilization and these factors. This finding suggests that it's not possible to predict parking demand based on urban context or other measurable factors that could easily be regulated through the zoning bylaw. Furthermore, fewer than half of the sites surveyed had peak parking occupancy over 50%, and fewer than 10% of sites surveyed reached peak occupancy rates of 90% or more. This means that there's an overall surplus of on-site parking at all times of the day and week in Edmonton. Together, this evidence suggests that the zoning bylaw may not be the right tool to regulate parking. Currently in Edmonton, we have high minimum parking requirements in our zoning bylaw. The results of the technical study support this claim. Parking regulations generally occur along a spectrum from minimum parking requirements to maximums. Sorry, I'll just put this in the correct view. <laughs> The middle ground is an idea that we're calling open option parking. Open option parking is the removal of minimum parking requirements in the zoning bylaw. In its place, the amount of on-site parking to be supplied for new developments will be determined by the landowner or business. Open option parking does not mean no parking. This is a market-based approach that helps to remove barriers to development by allowing choice and flexibility. For this reason, it's more likely to result in the right amount of parking, as businesses and landowners know their parking needs better than the city and have an interest in ensuring that they are met. Our current method of regulating on-site parking has resulted in an oversupply. An open option approach will be better at matching supply with demand. Open option parking has several benefits. It provides flexibility to meet a range of parking needs for different lifestyles, demographics, types of business, and locations in the city, it can help remove economic barriers to development. Uh, the cost of parking is very high, from 7,000 to around 60,000 per stall. And removing this economic barrier will help to create opportunity for more diverse, affordable housing choices and the walkable main street shopping areas and neighborhood amenities that Edmontonians love. It aligns with our policy objectives, such as more transportation options and reduced carbon emissions. And it was also supported by a majority of survey respondents asked to select their preferred option for regulating parking. 
And importantly, it enables the vibrant, compact, and walkable Edmonton envisioned by Connect Edmonton in the draft city plan. A challenge with open option parking is that it runs the risk of new homes and businesses not providing enough on-site parking for the users of the site, resulting in possible spillover parking onto the streets. With transformative change comes some risk. With an open option approach, some new developments will undersupply parking. This currently happens under existing regulations as well. While parking management measures can influence behavior and manage congestion, the supply of on-street parking is finite and needs to be managed as a st strategic public asset in support of our larger city building goals. When areas experience these pinch points, the city currently uses curbside parking management tools which include time-restricted parking, paid parking, the residential parking program, and enforcement. To ensure alignment between our regulatory approach and on-street parking management, a review of the residential parking program will occur through 2020. In addition, implementation will focus on change management, including public education and behavior change approaches, and the use, uh, and, and the use of emerging parking management technologies for wayfinding and on-street parking availability. It's also important to note that change will be gradual, coming into effect as homes and businesses are slowly developed or redeveloped across the city in the decades ahead. Another strategy to help manage parking demand is to enable shared parking. The proposed changes enable opportunities to share parking or lease out space to nearby properties. The ability for developments to share parking will allow for a more efficient use of Edmonton's existing oversupply of on-site parking and give homeowners and businesses greater choice and flexibility in how they use the space on their properties. Allowing developments to share parking could also help alleviate potential on-street parking pressure in situations where new development or business inadvertently under, under provides for parking. Since the proposed changes were pr presented to Urban Planning Committee on January 28th, a number of changes and refinements were made to better support the move to open option parking. New methods are proposed to calculate barrier-free parking and bicycle parking requirements in the absence of the minimum parking requirements. The proposed method of calculating barrier-free parking with deemed minimum parking requirements was updated. This update will ensure that barrier-free parking continues to be provided in line with today's requirements. Bicycle parking requirements are now proposed to be based on the floor area of non-residential uses and the number of dwellings for residential uses. The mechanism to allow shared parking has now been updated. A new vehicle parking use is proposed to replace the current accessory and non-accessory parking uses which currently prevent shared parking. A transportation demand management study remains a valuable tool for a developer to undertake as they plan out their development to meet the needs of a client. These studies may be requested in support of rezoning applications. Today's proposed amendments do not specify the potential to collect a transportation demand management study as a requirement. However, development officers can continue to require information related to parking as part of a development permit review. <clears throat> Existing parking requirements for the quarters overlay have been removed to ensure open option parking will apply to the quarters as it would for the rest of the city. The previously proposed requirement for vehicle access to be from a lane in all cases where lanes exist have been removed from the proposed amendments. Lane access will continue to be required in the mature neighborhood overlay and other select zones, but implications of implementing the access requirements citywide will be explored through the zoning bylaw renewal. Finally, the existing parking maximums are maintained and new maximums applied to commercial uses within key transit supported and main street areas. So what does this all mean for Edmonton? Parking is a powerful and, and often hidden force in shaping how our communities are designed. How parking is supplied, priced and used affects every aspect of how people live, work and move around. While transformative change comes with risk, it also has the potential to deliver significant long-term benefits. Open option parking provides built-in flexibility to potentially accommodate changes in technology, such as autonomous vehicles. It means improved choice and flexibility for Edmontonians, supporting cost savings and efficiency for businesses. It's more likely to result in the right amount of parking as businesses and homeowners know their needs best and have an interest in ensuring that they are met. And perhaps most importantly, open option parking represents a step towards achieving the city that we have heard Edmontonians want through the engagement for Connect Edmonton and the draft city plan. While this change represents a step towards achieving a more compact, walkable and vibrant Edmonton, it's important to note that the change will also be gradual, only coming into effect as sites are developed or redeveloped across the city in the decades ahead. 
thank you, and we'll be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm just looking at the time, and we are five minutes away from when we would normally break, so I don't know if we want to do the recess now and then start with speakers. Mr. Mayor is about to sit down, so I'll return the chair back to him. Yes, thank you, uh, Councillor Knack. I just uh, needed coffee, uh, which, um, but you raise a good point. Uh, perhaps we should take the break now before we start with the speakers. Uh, um, so why don't we move up the break by five minutes because we would have broke uh, from 3.30 to 3.45. So why don't we make it 3.25 to 3.40 and then uh, we'll come back with um, Miss Salvador uh, right at 3.40. Does that work? And then we'll just power through. Okay. All right. Uh, let's recess for 15 uh, with the presumed consent of the group and um, we'll uh, see you shortly.
All right, uh, roll call in 30 seconds. Get back to it. Carry on with speakers on the open option parking. So stand by. And we'll come back shortly. Okay, roll call, starting this time with Councillor McKean. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Welcome back, Councillor Nickel. Present. Hello, Councillor Pricat. Present. Welcome, Councillor Walters. Present. Welcome, Councillor Banga. Present. Hello, Councillor Carmel. Present. Welcome, Councillor Katarina. I'm here. Hello, Councillor Zadik. Present. Welcome, Councillor Essinger. Present. Welcome, Councillor Hamilton. Present. Welcome, Councillor Henderson. I am here. And Councillor Knack, I can visually see. Still here. Okay, excellent. So that's everybody. Uh, we'll now hear from speakers. Starting with those in favor on open option parking, uh, starting with Ms. Salvador. Go ahead. Ms. Salvador, are you yes. there? Oh. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Proceed. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, um, so good afternoon, Council. Thank you for the opportunity to participate virtually in today's hearing. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to actually thank Council for the thoughtful discussion around parking in relation to the Boyle Street development. Uh, that was a good reminder that the nature of mobility in our city is changing and that the city actually does have a wealth of tools at its disposal to manage on-street parking demand. All right, so... Yeah, Garden Suites has been a, a fairly vocal supporter of eliminating parking minimums since the beginning. Uh, and we were so proud of administration, both past and present, who have been working on this over the la uh, last few years. Not only have we been impressed by administration's engagement process, but their ability to communicate the benefits of eliminating parking minimums to the public has been very admirable. Uh, they've actually made uh, today's decision fairly easy, which is saying a lot because parking is usually a very hotly debated topic. I was pleasantly surprised when this item was unanimously supported at Urban Planning Committee uh, and referred to public hearing. That day, we heard from community members, businesses, and organizations across the political spectrum from different areas of the city, uh, really all saying the same thing, remove parking minimums. So this change checks all the boxes. You know, it's environmentally friendly, it's the fiscally responsible option, and importantly, it's the fair option. So it's the option that is going to give property owners more freedom to decide how much or how little parking they need. And it's the option that's going to save the city and property owners substantial amounts of money. So if we're truly concerned about, you know, reducing the financial burden that we place on citizens and local businesses, we should probably stop requiring they spend seven to $60,000 per stall whenever they develop a property when they might not even need um, that parking. So we do know that the cost of parking gets baked into the goods and services we buy, as well as the rent we pay. And in these challenging economic times, we must be aware of the impact parking policies have on the pocketbooks of Edmontonians. Finally, I think the, the most shocking and, uh, I guess, disappointing aspect of parking minimums is how wasteful they are. We know that Edmonton has a significant parking surplus across the entire city. Uh, while optimal parking utilization is 90%, we're hitting, you know, around 50% at peak hours at best. Now, removing parking minimums is a market-based approach. We've seen the outcomes of government overreach and excessive regulation where it doesn't belong, and in many cases, it has left us worse off. So this is an opportunity to, to course correct and let the market sort out our parking surplus so that one day we might be closer to that optimal usage. And with shared parking... We might even see homeowners or maybe apartment complexes, uh, possibly in the university area, rent out their unused stalls, which would, again, result in a more efficient use of our parking resources. 
I also think this is actually the the low risk option. Um, and I, I know you've heard this several times now, but this is going to be a very slow change. And just to provide some perspective on that, um, when Seattle eliminated their parking minimums, eight years later, 70% of new developments still built parking. So people in Edmonton, you know, we think of ourselves as a, a bit of a car city, and in many ways we are. You know, we've overbuilt our road networks and parking capacity to the point where we have a costly oversupply and a population that is reliant on personal automobiles to meet their needs. So this is not going to be uh, a change that we feel right away. And uh, sorry, that isn't going to change right away. And for that reason, we can expect that property owners are still going to build parking, even if minimums are removed. And if somehow, you know, uh, on-street parking does become a problem in some areas of the city, on-street management tools can be adopted. For example, selling parking permits to residents to ensure they have access to street-side parking, or even giving them to residents for free. And those who don't need them can sell them. All right, so just in closing, um, I wanted to, to bring COVID into this just really quickly uh, because I think it's relevant for the future of the city and all cities. So I think that the cities that are going to succeed in a post-COVID world are the ones that are agile and flexible enough to adapt to changing circumstances. The cities that are going to succeed are the ones who can respond to uncertainty and focus on creating healthy human habitats. In order to remain competitive as a city, Edmonton must free ourselves from the rigid auto-oriented policies that have caused many of the problems we currently face. And that's everything from climate change to infrastructure deficits to obesity and high taxes. Uh, in large part, those, those issues can be attributed to um, the, the mandated auto dependence that we introduced in the 1970s. So today really isn't about a switch being flipped. This is about a slowly, uh, slow turning of a dial towards the city that we continually say we want to be. It's a pragmatic choice and it's an incremental choice. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much for your time and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Salvador. Questions? Councillor Banga? Councillor Banga, do you have questions for Ms. Salvador? I do, Mr. Mayor. Um, Ms. Salvador, uh, thanks for coming in today and uh, and uh, explaining your uh, view on parking. Um, I mean, it's not that I do not agree. I do agree that uh, this is the direction we're going. Um, my question to you is, uh, initially when the parking, I guess, uh, buildings are designed uh, and the developers don't, uh, feel the need for parking at that time, would it limit uh, the, the buying or renting of uh, uh, those places to the future, uh, I guess, uh, generations or future uh, folks that are going to be moving in? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, when we... You know, if we put our developer hats on, decisions are made based on the target markets that we're trying to sell to, right? So when a developer decides whether they're going to supply, you know, one stall for every single person that's going to be living there, they're obviously targeting a market that is, um, you know, their car owners. Uh, on the flip side of that, there are some developers out there who are intentionally, you know, buying properties in walkable transit-oriented neighborhoods and designing their buildings with that in mind. And that means often having uh, reduced parking available. So in that sense, yes, you, you are limiting your market. You are, you're going after a specific type of consumer. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I think it's important that we give developers opportunities to, um, to, to do that in our city. And that actually aligns with sort of the, the overall goals of, of the city of Edmonton anyways, in relation to you know, large uh, guiding documents like the city plan. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does, but uh, then I do have another question for you. That's about uh, uh, the schools in, uh, in the older areas. There are only so many schools, uh, and uh, the, the school population or student population is, uh, is very, I guess it's going down. Could you tell me that uh, 
the families moving in there without the parking, um, would uh, that help this minimum cause, uh, parking cause, or uh, would uh, those families will be deterred from uh, moving in there? Um, so let me, I'll just try and understand your question. So uh, essentially you're asking, uh, in a lot of our mature neighborhoods, we've seen, you know, population decline. Um, our schools are kind of emptying out. We're having to close schools. And you're wondering whether whether new families will move in um, if there's no minimum parking requirements. That's correct. Okay. Um, so I think, yes, absolutely. Uh, a lot of the neighborhoods that we're talking about, you know, they are those mature neighborhoods. They're, um, they are closer to transit. They're closer to amenities. And I think the important thing to remember here is that if a neighborhood is still auto-oriented and if a developer is targeting a family-friendly market, they will likely still supply parking, right? So what we're really doing here is we're allowing the market to diversify, right? So, so that people who, who do require parking, who, who do want parking, that's still going to be there. That's always going to be there. Um, what we're doing is opening the door for that smaller segment of the population that, that does not drive or chooses not to drive. We're going to uh, allow them to have housing options as well that meet their needs. And Thank usually you. they're going to be more affordable as well Thank because you. the cost of parking isn't baked in. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Salvador? Councillor Paquette? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Ms. Salvador, for coming to speak. Um, I, you know, the conversation you just had with Councillor Banga um, made me think, uh, I'd like to ask your opinion should all neighborhoods be all things to all people? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's, that's my short answer. Um, I think that uh, people will choose which neighborhoods um, appeal to them based on what their needs are. And different neighborhoods are going to appeal to different types of people. And I don't think that's a bad thing. And different neighborhoods are going to have different amenities and structures and housing typologies. And that's okay. Um, I don't think that we need to have, you know, homogenous neighborhoods where everyone's needs are met um, in, in one particular place. Uh, so ho hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with uh, um, the city plan that we, that we are yet to approve but have been yes. working on? So, in your opinion, where does uh, a change like this fit in or work with the city plan, if at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a number of places this fits in. Um, one of the big ones is obviously our goal is to become more climate resilient as a city um, and to, you know, reduce our, our mobility share from being solely auto-oriented to more active forms of transportation as well as public transportation. Uh, I think another big one is in the city plan, you know, we do have a goal to limit our outward growth. And at this point, we are devoting so much land to road infrastructure and, uh, and parking that it's going to become very challenging to be able to accommodate another million people within our existing footprint if we're not using that, that scarce resource land for, for people. Uh, we need to we need to start prioritizing the housing of people over. And I know Kirsten's going to probably mention this, but we need to prioritize the housing of people over the housing of cars, um, and that's what we're doing right now. So, again, removing that um, from our bylaw is going to to open the door for that type of development that's envisioned in the city plan. Okay, and what about people who say, you know, this is all part of some kind of social engineering? You know, this is a city that's built for cars and uh, it should remain for cars? Uh, so, great question. Um, I would flip that around and say that we have actually socially engineered our cities to be car-oriented, and therefore we have socially engineered our society to be dependent on cars. Um, so I won't get into the whole that, history of... Uh, is there a problem with that? Um, so... In a number of ways, yes. Uh, from an environmental perspective, you know, we're seeing the consequences of, of heavy, heavy car use in the form of, of ongoing emissions. 
from a, um, a health perspective, we know that auto dependence does contribute to obesity, heart disease, a number of other health conditions. And, you know, there's costs attached to those, societal costs attached to those. And from a sociability perspective, you know, being able to create neighborhoods where um, people can walk around in a safe and healthy manner, they can interact with their neighbors, uh, they can live locally, shop, go to school, go to work uh, within a, a certain area instead of having to drive everywhere to meet the basic needs of, of their life. Um, those, are, those are some of the consequences of the socially engineered um, car culture that we've created. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Salvador? Not seeing any, then thank you very much. We'll go to Mr. Pai next. Thank you. Mr. Pai? Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Tell me if that's working. Yes, we can see you and hear you. Proceed. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Anand Pai, and I'm with NAOP Edmonton, the Association of Commercial Real Estate Development. Uh, so I just wanted to take a second uh, to, to thank council and administration, not only for this item, but, uh, but for several of the policies that have helped uh, businesses that we work with uh, as they recover from, from the COVID-19 crisis. So, you know, other uh, other policies that I think have, have helped include things like temporary patios and direct business support. And all of these positive examples, just zooming out, to me have three things in common. They align city goals and industry goals for having more efficiency. They reduce red tape and encourage new businesses. And they're incremental. So we can take a look at how they're doing and, and incorporate changes as we go. So, you know, we're, we're already seeing indoor and outdoor retail centers consider how they'll use their unused parking and unused spaces in, now and into the future. So that's, that concludes my comments. I just want to thank uh, Council Council uh, for encouraging these efficiencies and administration for, for working on them and uh, be open for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Pai? Councillor Knack, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Mr. Pai, for uh, joining us today. And again, just, and I think we'll probably hear this question a few times, but just because you have a membership that represents a variety of different business uses, I wanted to ask you the question, similar to what, what we might hear as concerns, do you foresee your members you know, suddenly eliminating their parking or, or any new developments going up, particularly, you know, as you get further out into the suburban communities or into industrial areas or, or any of the areas where you have a wide range where your members covered, do you think, do you think they're still going to be providing ample parking? Do you think there's a, there's a need for them to do that? Um, and can you share your thoughts on what you've been hearing? Definitely. I think uh, we're going to see developers in the suburbs providing parking. Now we have administration working on, on options for bike parking and making transportation management uh, uh, studies a part of those new development processes. So I think that'll be in part. And then I also see developers in the suburbs in retail centers kind of diversifying those centers and, and considering uh, considering retail and and uh, and mixed use, some residential as well as uh, as well as retail and even some uh, industrial uses like uh, like warehousing, uh, and so I think that'll just lead to to more efficiency. But I don't think it'll be a whole scale change. Okay. The other sort of question I've heard it suggested that. Um, you know, even if you had someone who wanted, for some, for whatever number of reasons, that they wanted to build a suburban shopping center, that they might not get even financed if they don't have. So, so the groups that will finance those areas look at: do they have ample parking for their potential customers to be able to attract retail tenants? Is that correct? I've, I've heard that suggested before, and I don't know if that's a fair comment. No, absolutely. A good comment. 
it definitely affects the saleability of, uh, of retail centers to, to have parking and just make sure that the parking works within the context of the, of, of the community for sure. Okay. Great. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Pai? Not seeing any. Then next up is Ann Stevenson. Followed by Chris DeLaba. So get yourself ready, Chris. Uh, Ann, you're up next. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ann Stevenson, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Right at Home Housing Society. Thanks very much for having me in uh, such an accessible format. So our organization builds and manages affordable housing across the city. We currently house over 1,200 Edmontonians. Today, I wanted to provide an overview of the various types of costs that minimum parking requirements have to organizations like ours and highlight how important the bylaw before you is in removing these barriers to achieving Edmonton's affordable housing goals. Turning to slide two, the first cost to minimum parking requirements is upfront capital costs when building new affordable housing. This photo shows the $1 million parkade that is required as part of the construction of Ambrose Place, a permanent supportive housing project designed and built by Nigan and Housing Ventures. This underused parking facility continues to cost the organization roughly $60,000 a year in debt servicing, money that could otherwise be directed towards the exceptional work being done by Niganan in support of Edmonton's most vulnerable residents. Another cost of parking requirements is highlighted on slide three, and that is the opportunity cost of accommodating minimum parking requirements on site. An example of this comes from the Right at Home North Point project. Which was, which was required to eliminate an entire floor of housing units in order to accommodate an undercross parkade, despite there being sufficient uh, surface parking spaces to meet the parking needs of residents. A similar scenario played out with the Brentwood Homes development for Terrace Centre Youth Parent and dealt with countless other developments across the city. This loss of affordable housing units in favour of underused parking spaces is a cost that works against our city's efforts to ensure housing security for all Edmontonians. On slide number four, we see the final cost imposed by minimum parking requirements. The cost of uncertainty created by appeals when parking minimums aren't met. Affordable housing faces a range of stigmas and barriers in building projects in new neighborhoods. And minimum parking requirements provide residents with a mechanism to delay or derail affordable housing development, even when local concerns don't specifically relate to parking impacts, but rather fears and misconceptions about affordable housing in general. This uncertainty puts additional risk and costs onto nonprofit affordable housing providers and takes away from investment in our city. In the case of the Holy Trinity site illustrated here, uh, that could be a potential loss of $45 million invested into our city. So the images I've shared so far today are pretty bleak. They are hardly the types of spaces, uh, or sorry, they are the types of spaces that are created by minimum parking requirements and hardly the type of city that many of us would aspire to. Fortunately, turning to our final slide, number five, we see how implementing these bylaw changes can help transform our city by creating places that prioritize people, not parking. We are so grateful uh, to the leadership and commitment that this council has shown to affordable housing. And on behalf of Right at Home and those we serve, uh, I urge council to support this exciting initiative that will remove a significant barrier we face in achieving our community's affordable housing goals. Thank you again uh, for the opportunity to present, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Stevenson. Questions? Any questions for Ms. Stevenson? Not seeing any. Thank you again for uh, sharing some of that information previously. Uh, um, appreciate that. Uh, next is Mr. DeLaba, followed by Michaela David. Uh, Mr. DeLaba, go ahead. The floor is yours. Um, I guess to, I'm going to keep this relatively brief and short, as difficult as that may be for our, those who know me. Um, I think this is an, an, a major move that the City of Edmonton can do as it moves towards creating policies to create a more sustainable, compact, and walkable city. Um, it is, uh, you know, we, we, I think we are seeing cities change and shift 
uh, from coast to coast to coast as how they actually ultimately want to be designed and planned out. And, and parking regulations can be one of the biggest barriers where you have a standardized metric place on whether or not you need to provide X number of stalls dependent on the type of use. Um, one of the questions that came up earlier from one of the council members, I believe it was Councillor Knack, as developers, when we're looking at creating a project and determining what the right balance of parking is, it's all premised on the fact is if we're providing a certain size of space or number of units and an X number of parking stalls or no parking stalls, is it viable? Uh, and you're right. You know, we do have questions asked by lenders when you're bringing forward a project to be financed on whether or not the development uh, metrics make sense uh, and if there are any major risks that the lender sees as to why they shouldn't finance a particular project. And this comes from even an acquisition of an existing building uh, or developing from ground up or an adaptive reuse of the building. So we do a thorough analysis to ultimately ensure that we're providing the amount of parking that's going to ensure that that project is feasible. And, you know, as many know, we develop projects uh, such as Crawford Block that has zero parking stalls on site, and we develop projects that has a number of parking stalls, uh, such as Linwood Shopping Centre or North District, where we have to provide a certain amount of parking in order for the tenants to want to come to that shopping centre. So it is one of those uh, opportunities here that allows the market to, to essentially determine how much parking is required to sustain the development. I think it also works towards uh, accommodating some of the new modes of transportation that really weren't around uh, five years ago, uh, such as a lot of ride-sharing programs, Uber, Lyft, uh, even scooters. Um, that is becoming a new reality that ultimately I think parking bylaws and, and the metrics tied to them can address. Uh, one of the most difficult things in any municipality is ensuring policy is adaptable with the shifts uh, that occur over time. May that be shifts in the built form that people are choosing, shifts in her terms of how we um, reuse a lot of our existing building stock, shifts in how we want to develop our transit and our transportation infrastructure. And I think this open parking is a major step towards ensuring that the city is adaptable and adaptable to a future that allows various forms of development on the periphery of the city and the core of the city and our main streets. Uh, and in particularly allowing us, uh, in some cases, where we're utilizing an existing building and there is no parking on site, but yet, based on a certain predetermined uh, parking requirement, you're requesting a variance. And that's even on buildings that were built 50, 60 years ago. Um, that, uh, that that becomes a risk to us uh, that, uh, in some cases, if a variance is granted, that on the basis of not having one or two visitor parking stalls, is subject to an appeal to the SDB. So I think this is a fantastic move. Uh, I applaud the city administration uh, and uh, the, the Urban Planning Committee's endorsement to move forward to an actual text amendment to the zoning bylaw. And I'm available for any questions from this point. Thank you, Mr. DeLaba. You. Any questions? Not seeing any, then thank you very much for those comments. Next is Michaela David, followed by Mariah Samji. Michaela? Michaela David? Hello? Yes, there you are. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of the Urban Development Institute Edmonton region. I also work for Melcourt Development in Edmonton as a development manager in land development. So thank you very much for the opportunity to provide comments on open option parking as presented and discussed today. It's an exciting and interesting concept. So um, UDI is supportive of open option parking. Uh, we believe this policy will allow more flexibility for developers to incorporate parking into their projects in a way that efficiently meets market demands and not just bylaw requirements. We believe the flexibility offered by open option parking would better allow the development of more diverse housing types, um, as approved under the missing middle zoning, as an example, as well as assist in achieving our density requirements in accordance with the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board Growth Plan. As members, we are committed to building communities that meet the needs of our residents, and 
and that definitely includes sufficient parking. Projects or developments that do not allow for adequate parking will be unattractive to the market. And projects that incorporate parking solely to meet parking minimums discourage innovative housing forms and greatly reduce affordability. So as described, UDI would like to see the end of parking minimums and to allow market demand and consumer choice to better influence parking requirements, as would be made possible by this open option parking approach. So in closing, we're very supportive of open option parking, um, and we are very appreciative of the city's engagement with our organization on this topic. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ms. David. Any questions? Sorry, I didn't have my video on. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I don't see any questions for you. Thank you for those comments. Next is Mariah Samji. Go ahead. Followed by Yasushi Oki. Mariah, are you there? I'm here. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you today for hearing from IDEA. At IDEA, we're often asked, how can we remove barriers to missing middle development, density, and diverse housing options? There are limited things we can change that are in our control. Parking is one of the most impactful regulations that create financial and technical barriers to medium-scale development for both residential and commercial inflow, as well as gentle density, which is a part of our overall city objectives. Current parking requirements are not nimble enough to move with park parking demands and market demands. The parking study clearly shows that parking is oversupplied across all residential and mixed-use categories, even more so among commercial land uses. Business owners, builders, developers understand their markets. They use market studies and sales data to determine the correct amount of parking for each project they take. We have heard from many of our members that current regulations have created opportunities where they were unable to build gentle density and missing middle development because of the space needed to dedicate to parking. We have also heard from many of our members that research shows that as of now, Edmonton is not ready for multiple buildings with zero parking. The infill community isn't looking to build a lot of developments with zero parking, but it is looking to build contextual parking based on the needs of the project. You've heard, me all, you've heard me say this all before. However, I wanted to share two stories with you today. The first story comes from the day after our last meeting about this at Urban Planning Committee. An architect who works with me out of the same co-working space came up to me, excited about the opportunity for this change. He has a client who has a restaurant on White Ave, who owns a parking lot next to him and behind him, who for years has wanted to do something with these uh, plots of land hasn't been able to because of our parking requirements. The parking lots are very rarely utilized and has created dead spaces along White Ave, one of our main streets in Edmonton. As soon as they heard that this was being contemplated, they started to looking into their new options. The second story I want to share with you is from a community member. She's a small business owner in Edmonton who shared with us that she's lost out on two big business opportunities. Uh, for expansion and creation of new businesses because of our current parking requirements. I also spent a lot of time reflecting on the conversation we had last time around on-street parking management. As Edmonton grows, we are now in the next phase where we need to utilize other tools in our toolbox to manage parking and meet our objectives. Wayfinding and on-street parking management programs and paid parking are tools that we have successfully used as noted in previous conversations today. And there are key resources that we need to continue to use to help mitigate situations once on-street parking becomes an issue. I also asked our industry members about the market perspective on on-street parking. And they said, they said, as of right now, it's not a selling feature for residential rentals or ownership. Finally, I wanted to state how important it is for this change in Edmonton. For a long time now, we have been overbuilding parking, which has led to very expensive land that is broken up by blocks of areas that are less pedestrian friendly. This change also signals to investors inside and outside of Edmonton that we are a place to build, and we are nimble enough to react. And lastly, it shows that Edmonton is a city that reacts to its research and data. The extensive research done points to the need for change. I'd like to thank you so much 
and thank administration so much for the work and the research, the outreach and engagement they did, and thank you to Council for considering this change. We ask that you support this today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanji. Questions? Not seeing any for you. Next up is Yasushi Oki, followed by Adil Kodian. Hi, Yasushi Oki has left the oh. call. Okay. Next, then, is Adil Kodian, followed by Kristen Goa. Adil, go ahead. Um, good morning, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Adil Kodian. I'm part of the executive team at Rohit. I'm here today, though, on behalf of the Canadian Home Builders Association, Edmonton Region. Um, CHPA ER is a not-for-profit organization representing more than 450 member companies in the greater Edmonton region. Um, our member companies currently account for about 75% of the new homes being built in the city of Edmonton. Today I want to speak in support of the implementation of open option parking. This change uh, shifts the responsibility of determining the right amount of parking to the landowner and the builder instead of using a standard minimum parking formula which is proven to result in underutilization of land. Uh, the parking study we saw, uh, we saw an excerpt of a little bit earlier shows that factors like employment density, population density, walking scores don't have much correlation with the observed utilization of parking. Um, these positive changes um, are not about creating a parking free for all, but are about removing barriers to development and providing Edmontonians with more choice to fit their lifestyles and needs. Without this change, Edmontonians are stuck with the cost of paying for a parking stall even if they do not need one. Um, at 10 to 60,000 per stall, depending on whether the stall is a surface stall or in a, you know, the third level, fourth level of an underground parquet, a stall can cost the homeowner hundreds of dollars per month and make the home unattainable for the person looking to buy that. Open option parking will not only save homeowners money, but will contribute to a much more efficient use of space and resources and land in a time where we must be conscious of our environmental impact. It also allows builders to accommodate innovations like car shares, ride shares, self-driving cars, and even items that we currently can't even think of by leaving it open to the market. The proposed, change, proposed changes will do just that while not immediately impacting the delivery of parking supply. I must reiterate here that this doesn't mean industry will not provide parking. It just means that industry will now have the option of providing the right up amount of parking for each project based on who the project actually caters to. Um, in closing, uh, CHPA ER fully supports the proposed changes in front of you today. We value our relationship with the city. And thank you for the continued engagement of industry on this particular topic. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I have, I'm available for questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Kodian? Any questions for Mr. Kodian's sidekick? Who's coming to work with Papa? <laughs> That's great. Uh, no questions uh, for either of you. But thanks for joining. Uh, next is Kristen Goa, followed by Katie Ingram. Kristen? Oh, there we go. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here today wearing a number of hats. Uh, I am Ideas Outreach Director for another week or so. Um, and then, um, you know, also participated in. Uh, a member of the Guiding Coalition on Public Engagement and a number of other uh, roles. But most importantly, I'm a community member who has had hundreds of conversations about parking and the anxiety about parking that happens in Metro New York. Our context has changed dramatically since the committee meeting on this item. Um, how we think about allocation of space has taken on a new urgency in the context of COVID-19 and the calls to address systemic racism. Um, these issues reiterate the need to be more intentional about our priorities regarding space, including parking space. Uh, COVID-19 is just that we need more space for people, and Black Lives Matter has really demonstrated that how we engage in space is significantly circumscribed by who we are and where we are. Space and money spent on parking that isn't evidence-based is a decision about who, or more specifically what, is our priority. As I said last time, and um, Ashley alluded to, we have solved the affordable housing problem for cars. So I want 
encourage you to approve citywide open option parking today and then speak a little bit about um, why community responds the way they do to parking and what we can do about it. Everyone who drives, which I reiterate is not everyone, um, experiences parking stress um, when they can't find a spot to put their car. And we remember that stress. Our brains are wired to pay attention and remember threats. However, we don't tend to remember the 99% of time that we can find a parking spot relatively easily. The issues of parking that come up so frequently are often a product of that impacting stress and larger concerns related to community change and feelings of powerlessness. These feelings need to be understood, they need to be acknowledged, and communities need support to navigate these situations. But parking is very rarely the fundamental issue, and changes to parking to appease these fears rarely address underlying concerns or feelings of threat and, um, and aren't really helping the community build the kind of place they want. Um, parking is an issue. I think we'll probably not leave us anytime soon, but how we manage this change and support communities through it matters. Um, that, however, is not the role of our zoning bylaw. As long as we have policy that is not evidence-based and sets expectations that we often can't and shouldn't meet, um, we're just exacerbating those feelings and undermining trust in community. And we're also undermining our city building goals. So leadership does involve taking courageous steps um, that are usually a change um, and bringing forward new ideas and solutions based on evidence. It does also require bringing people along and supporting them through the change. Um, this needs empathy, it needs patience, and it also needs courage. Um, we do need to be intentional about communication, engagement, change management in terms of how we work with communities through this and many of our other city initiatives. Um, this is a place where council administration, industry, and community groups can take leadership. With the rapid disruption we are currently experiencing, people have amplified feelings of anger, anxiety, and stress around change. Uh, that's going to be with us for a long time. Keeping parking minimums will change it or even help it. Um, but we can support people in navigating the discomfort of the unknown. In practical terms, this change is an evolution, as other people said, not a revolution. It won't be noticeable for most people. It won't change much overnight. But it will make a significant difference to the most innovative community-oriented project. Over time, it will have noticeable impact on affordability, the range of housing options, missing middle housing, invisible and gentle density, neighborhood amenities, and more granular commercial retail, the types of projects communities are clamoring for. So rather than expend time, money, resources, and emotional energy on on-site parking requirements that aren't data-driven and typically don't address the most significant concerns or impacts on community, we need to shift our weight focus to wayfinding, community-based change management, more nimble and responsive management of our city-owned parking assets, including the parking in front of everyone's homes, and improving options for bike parking, delivery, share parking, accessible parking, loading zones, etc. Parking minimums doesn't do any of that. Um, there are communities, including mine, where we do see increased parking congestion. However, the study is clear there are still ample options. And just as building a wider road brings more cars, the same goes for parking. It is a very expensive land use decision, and most of the time it's not highest and best use. In our case, and most neighborhoods um, where I've had these conversations, more intentional management of on-street parking would mitigate most of the friction. Putting this responsibility to private landowners and development is inefficient and doesn't actually typically solve the problem. So over time, if we meet our density objectives, we may need parking management or shared parking options to solve these problems, but again, more private single-use on-site parking won't solve The four goals in city plans, healthy cities, urban places, prosperity, and climate resilience. Are we done? Yeah, i got to get you to wind, wind up. <laughs> so basically, um, city plan and our other city initiatives are going to need um, a lot of empathy, courage, change through processes, that's not going to change. But this is a really good lesson, and we shouldn't be scared of making Thank it. you. Thank you, Ms. Go. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Go? Not seeing any, then uh, thank you very much uh, for the many hats you have spoken from underneath. Uh, next is Katie Ingram, followed by uh, Bob Summers. Katie, are you there? 
Yes, I am. Go ahead. Hello. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, I uh, am joining today to um, bring the small business perspective uh, to this discussion. Um, I spoke last year um, when this was brought forward about what I had endured as a business owner trying to open a business with um, the current um, bylaws that exist in regards to uh, minimum parking requirements uh, and how detrimental that has been to um, building and developing the two businesses uh, that I currently have, ultimately forcing us to open our second business during the global pandemic, which has been unfortunate. Um, but what I really want to ask as council today is to really look at what um, what you want the city to have, um, what you want the city to attract, and everything that needs to be there in order for that to happen. And so if if you want to be attracting talent to the city, then you need to have vibrant small business and a vibrant hospitality uh, culture. And by um, imposing these parking minimums and uh, making it extremely difficult to open a business in Edmonton, uh, what is missing? Uh, what is missing from the fabric of your city um, because of parking? Uh, and especially, uh, just to reiterate Ashley's uh, point about that not every uh, neighborhood or not every development needs to cater to everybody. Uh, specifically for us, you know, on the south side of the river, uh, at the top of Roland Road, we don't need parking. Um, and that's been evidenced by uh, the recent closure of the road, the one lane in front of us, uh, to develop a temporary patio during um, this COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, that's taken away a ton of our on-street parking. And not only um, has it um, made the street look better, uh, uh, adding to the vibrancy of the neighborhood, it's also um, added to the walkability and bikeability of that neighborhood that was already there. By providing parking, we're saying that we cater to everybody coming from everywhere else which we love that. We, we love the fact that people find us a destination, but we are first and foremost there for the neighborhood, and we want to encourage people to uh, live where they live. Uh, and so providing those arbitrary uh, parking minimums is going to really, um, it's going to really thwart continued small business growth in these older mature neighborhoods. And I really don't think that it aligns with the vision of this city and certainly not the vision uh, into the future. And when we look at a post-COVID world um, where small business in this city, in this province, across this country, in this world is going to need significant help and especially retail um, small business, we're going to, um, we're going to need all the help that we can get. And I just don't think that, um, catering to cars is what's going to help us in this post-COVID world and into the future in general. That's all I have for today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions uh, for Ms. Ingram? Not seeing any. Thank you very much for those comments. Bob Summers is next. Okay, um, great. Uh, thank you, um, Council, for, for the time to speak to you today. I'm going to keep this really short. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a uh, professor of urban planning at the University of Alberta, and um, I think this is a, a great idea, and I want to commend administration and Council for supporting it uh, and getting it to this uh, point. Um, lots of people have said lots of great things, so basically I'll just say a few things, and then if people have questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. Uh, I'll note that the land use bylaw isn't the place uh, to deal with this. It's an inefficient and ineffective way to deal with parking. There are way better ways to do this uh, through managing parking, uh, on-street parking, private parking, through other mechanisms. Um, really, uh, you should all vote yes on this issue. I uh, hope you're all leaning that way. Parking minimums are really a stupid way to, to manage the issue. 
uh, from both a city perspective and a free market perspective. So um, I'll leave it at that because all the other things I was going to say have been said by lots of other people. Well, thank you uh, very much, Professor Summers. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I'll just check to see if there are any questions for you. Not seeing any, then uh, Great, thank you. was Matthew Hoyt able to join us in the end? Okay, Mr. Hoyt, go ahead. I'm not sure if I'll be brief or not because I haven't really timed this, but uh, uh, I enjoyed speaking in front of uh, council in January about this same thing. Uh, I'll just reiterate a couple things I said then. Uh, since 1960, through parking minimums, we've made it illegal to reproduce White Avenue, 104th Street, 124th Street, pick any pre-war developed general shopping place people actually want to be in the city, and we've made it illegal to put that many businesses close together. Uh, if you look at the most successful from a municipal basis uh, commercial districts across Canada, you know, uh, Queen Street West in Toronto, St. Catharines in Montreal, Barrington Street in Halifax, you know, uh, Sherbrooke Street in uh, in uh, Winnipeg, you know, downtown Vancouver, wherever it is, uh, all of those were built in a time before we worried about where people were going to park. Free parking turns socialists into capitalists and capitalists into socialists. And I don't... Hello? Sorry. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, um, uh, we, we heard from the small business perspective that uh, it covers it two ways. One, when we create nice small businesses in communities, we help, it, we help people live where their house is and create better communities that way by integrating you know, where people travel within their neighborhoods. And we also create places where people want to be. So uh, I, I, I say it frequently that when you create great spaces, uh, people will go there. And when people get together in cities, they generally spend money. And when you create places just for cars, people only go there till they have to, which is partly why, you know, online shopping is eating big box stores lunch. Nobody really wants to walk across the parking lot in, uh, at a big box store. And from a city's perspective, you make money by, by, uh, tax, you know, by, um, by property taxes. You've heard repeatedly people talk about underused parking. From the city perspective, that should be underpriced land that you guys are losing tax revenue on. Where else are you going to get to make a vote that allows you to increase the tax basis in such a way that improves the spaces in, that are affected, creating areas in the city where people want to be? Um, that's all I've got. Thank you, Mr. Hoyt. Questions? Not seeing any then, we'll uh, thank you uh, to those who spoke in favor. We'll now hear from those registered in opposition. First up is Climate Tan. Go ahead, you have five minutes. Hi, uh, I'm Climate Tan. Uh, I'm a, it's funny, it, it, the introduction sounds like I'm an antagonist to, to this proposal. Uh, which is definitely not the case. Uh, I do, however, as a tenant on 124th Street, as a business tenant on 124th Street for the last, uh, on 124th Street, 107 Ave, for the last 15 years, and as well as a residential tenant on 125th Street and 107 Ave, about the last 15 years, um, and being directly beside uh, a theater that is being rebuilt uh, and also being a neighbor of that theater before it has been rebuilt, I, um, I, I guess I'm bringing, you know, like some cautionary concerns. Uh, one of the biggest concerns I have are, is the allocation of loading zones specifically for commercial properties. And we see, and I was reviewing um, the, the proposed bylaw, uh, page 61, that there will be no... Uh, I guess like zoning or development permit application requirements for properties below 2,500 square meters, um, which means that they will have to access loading either through alleyways or through street in front of the building. Um, and so 
especially when we start seeing more buildings in the interest of density being developed, they're like all the way to the edges of property lines. That this becomes a big concern. Um, I noticed too, bylaw five five nine zero section twelve, that there is a alley parking bylaw which prevents uh, uh, vehicles from blocking traffic, um, but allows them to use uh, use the alleys for temporary loading for up to thirty minutes if they have commercial plates. Uh, I know that during construction, that there have been construction vehicles that have parked behind that building uh, or the building beside us and have blocked um, access to an entire apartment's worth of parking stalls, uh, approximately 20 stalls there, as well as blocking off commercial, um, actually commercially plated vehicles in that space too. And uh, as a tenant in this building directly beside, we've just been told, like, you know, too bad, just deal with it kind of thing. I actually called the city 311 this morning to see what it would take to get one of those special permits in order to park in an alley, and uh, I haven't been like I haven't had my application directly rejected yet. But it appears that uh, I have a application in the works for allowing uh, temporary parking in an alley that will block uh, like regular traffic flow. Um, I should also note too that I am a volunteer private agency enforcement officer for um, private property parking. And uh, this is especially interesting in light of, um, I guess, Mr. Illingsworth, uh, Senior Planner Trevor Illingsworth's uh, presentation earlier. I just thought I'd touch on three points really quickly here. Um, bicycle parking, uh, belief that overflow parking will only overflow into the street, as well as the belief that tenants and neighboring businesses will negotiate parking to, to share parking. And I can say that um, actually, like, I've seen the, uh, the proposed bylaw changes that bicycle parking is to allocate a minimum of 10% of uh, number of stalls for bikes as, of, uh, versus, like, total number of, like, motor vehicle parking stalls, which sounds, uh, I don't know, like, interesting. Basically, 10% of zero stalls is still kind of a concern. Um, I, I actually cycle all year. Um, when I cycle to the city tower to drop off some of these tickets, I can't even find a, a bicycle parking spot. And this is a city of Edmonton property, so it's just something that I, I am a little bit concerned of. Like, you know, we can find parking spots in uh, winter, of course. Uh, the belief that overflow parking will only occur into the street. Uh, we know that a lot of parking actually, uh, you know, like, say, when the theater was open, any time that there was a theater event, people would actually park uh, all over the property here while I'm trying to do a production. Um, you know, like, I'm a fashion and uh, architecture photographer operating out of this space and uh, I you know like I have to schedule around their whatever else is going on next door um, probably I mean we all love Duchess um, Duchess actually doesn't have their own parking either and that brings me to the third point where the belief that tenants and businesses will negotiate for parking and um, uh, a good friend of uh, the studio who used to manage that store when approached uh, regarding uh, both employees and customers parking in our parking stalls wrote a uh, like cordial, uh, but you know, sort of explanatory response to our landlord that uh, they are not responsible for how their people park, and that these are suggestions for how to get uh, how to set up a private agency enforcement system, and these are people who you can hire to go and enforce parking for you. And that is, I, I believe, like reflective of the, the general attitude of, I think, like businesses going through. Again, like I'm, I am not opposed to proposed changes uh, to removing parking minimums, especially for residential property. Uh, I, I still have a few concerns from my personal experience. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, questions from members of council for Mr. Tan. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Go ahead, Councillor McKean. Uh, yeah, Mr. Tan, I, had, had a, I was really leaning into my computer to hear you, so I don't know if anybody else was struggling, but... Oh, sorry. Um, it seems to me that, and in, in your last statement was that you generally support this, and there will be trade-offs. Uh, we've, heard, uh, we've heard private... Um, Sector representatives talk about the stimulus effect, and I think we all want to see more 124th Street, more White Avenue. 
uh, style of, of uh, shopping uh, district. So there is a trade off. But do you think then that it's possible that as we get a little more sophisticated around this, we'll be able to develop parking programs and enforcement? Uh, certainly, adding in more parking, uh, sorry, bike parking facilities. That this is a start, and it would be your submissions. I would think that we can't ignore the fact, as uh, the city can't ignore the fact, it still has a lot of work to do to to make sure that this works for everyone. Mr. Keen, uh, I was actually going to thank you earlier for your other note about how it's, I think it's important to hold landowners or business owners or new developers to, uh, to you know, like, I guess, like enforcing or like like ensuring that they are doing what it takes to use the parking that they say that they're going to be offering and stuff like that. So I, I am actually really looking forward to what uh, you and city council and maybe us as a community can develop together. Uh, my, my biggest concern actually is not even so much about uh, regular like passenger vehicle parking, like I, I know that people are going to find parking where they need to find parking. My bigger concern is actually loading zones. Um, and as I pointed out, there there are like as you know in actually your your riding there is or your sorry your ward that there is a building that is going up where there is zero loading zone dedicated to that building, uh, and it is actually built up right to the property lines and. Well, like, you know, like, yeah, they're, like, and it's actually a major turning area as well, too. I'm actually uh, very unsure how a theater intends to spin sets and do construction uh, without any safe way to park, uh, uh, like, a cargo vehicle, and potentially for, like, for long periods of time. Yeah. So will you do me a favor? Will you email me and we can get together for a socially distanced coffee? Sure, and, yeah, and I was chat gonna, about. I'm going to suggest that I, um, I actually, I have a beautiful espresso set up in my studio, so I will give you the address and make you something. Because <laughs> we get, I want to discuss this further offline uh, with you because I think, <clears throat> as you mentioned, uh, there's some work to do yet. Um, but I, I think, um, man, we're we're getting a lot of strong arguments to move ahead with this uh, with this parking regulation change. So. But yeah, absolutely. I think like, like uh, the the majority of the proposal sounds excellent, and especially on the residential side, I think that everything yeah. to me like absolutely no objection. See, I'm fully supportive. Of. Hey, email me, please. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you are welcome. Let me know how the coffee is. Um, Mr. Hukalak is last. Marcel. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Thank you. My name is Marcel Heikelak. I'm representing the Belgravia Community League. I am Belgravia's Director of Planning in Place. Uh, I want to thank Council and Administration for finding a way to hold this hearing during a pandemic uh, and thereby upholding our democratic values. Um, Belgravia Community League does object to this proposed bylaw amendment. We note uh, proposed clause 54.2 part 2 part B Parts 1 and 2 indicate that there are no maximum number of parking stalls for underground parkades and for lands within 200 meters of an LRT station. We object to this proposed clause and related clauses because, first, it contravenes the entire philosophy, the entire underlying philosophy of the open option parking to limit total parking to improve livability in our city by providing better walking, cycling, and transit opportunities. Why would we continue to allow a loophole of unlimited parking when our own studies show there is far too much parking? Second, it contributes, contravenes city goals for density, walkability, bikeability, and transit growth. These goals are also reflected in the McKernan Belgravia Area Redevelopment Plan. Third, it will detrimentally affect Belgravia in two different ways. Uh, and first of all, you have to understand uh, our context that there is a severe parking ride stall shortage for the South LRT line. So the first way we get affected is apartment developments in Belgravia and the McCurtain Hip, that's the part of McCurtain West of 114th Street, will build underground stalls. 
it will be a marginal cost for them to increase the parking uh, construction to sell uh, LRT to park and riders. This will increase traffic in our local roads and further congestion our already congested key access points. The second way we'll get affected is by the nearby institutions, which are, which are both to Belgravia's north and south, as they can build unlimited underground parking. This contravenes current city infrastructure already, that already encourages LRT, bus, walking, and biking to the, these institutions. And the city is not entertaining any widening of 114th Street or other roads in the inner city. I also note that for walking, uh, for Belgravians, we are within walking distances of these campuses. A lot of people here do walk there to the campuses and the city will likely install a pedestrian crosswalk on the west side of 114th Street and University Avenue intersection later this year as a result of a traffic study advocated by Belgravia and supported by this council. This and other actions will make that walking trip easier for us. Thank you. Please also know that Belgravia is happy that the administration brought forward the par many parking progressive changes, many people spoke to that already, to, uh, in, in this amendment regarding limiting the amount of car parking. Also, we are grateful for the democratic process, such as sharing information to review that is clear and transparent that the administration and council use to allow us to have input. I have a... Um, a bunch of other information on other areas I won't speak to directly, but if somebody's interested, I could speak to uh, if underground parking is so expensive it can't happen, or a notion that maybe no one will use uh, the parking in Belgravia, or possibly object the, the position that uh, Belgravia is already taking that we're objecting to the entire bylaw, even though it's really one or two small clauses we're objecting to. Um, if you need to, I can expand on that. So to conclude, Belgravia will support this bylaw if it were amended to put limits on the amount of underground parking similar to those that are already in the bylaw for above ground parking structures. We ask that you amend the bylaw to these, add these limits, helping Belgravia and Edmonton become more livable. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks, Marcel. Councillor Henderson's got questions for you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll ask these of you because I was going to ask some administration because, you know, we've seen a great deal of this bylaw before, um, which is why, you know, you're not hearing a lot of questions from us. But the one thing that is new in here, and I think this is what you're referring to, was getting rid of the concept of, uh, of non-accessory parking. Um, and I know uh, probably in Belgravia, but I know I'm hearing from a number of the neighborhoods around the university that that's creating a real concern. Um, because it allows even in a residential circumstance um, for people to be able to rent out their parking, and 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 I and I and I think you're talking about a kind of macro example of that. But I'm I'm wondering, if, you know, and I understand why we want to do it for the shared parking. But I'm wondering, if we've, I'm just not entirely convinced we've come out of the right way, because I think you're describing some unintended consequences of that that actually may encourage more parking to go in and not less. Correct. Yes, that's correct. And, and uh, we have, as a board, uh, identified that um, the non-accessory issue is there, that there are houses that will sell parking stalls to university students and staff, hospital staff and visitors, uh, even up to park uh, special events at the stadium or the uh, Rexall, uh, not Rexall, the uh, ICE district. So, so there's lots of potential there. Uh, we think the bigger problem is the underground parking, so that's why we're supposed to speak about that. But yes, um, the uh, and I think that that may well be for your community, but I would think you know for some of the communities even close to the university, Windsor Park, Garno in particular, um, and 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 absolutely, I'm sure, and I know Councillor Katarina has had this issue around the stadium for years. Um, you know, there is there is a change here that that could create an unintended consequence, correct? And I'm, I'm just wondering if we could deal with that consequence, whether or not your concern about the underground parking also will go away because it wouldn't be rentable. Yeah, I don't know uh, an easy way to deal with the, the non-accessory part. I, I kind of like the way the city is going with it, uh, but I do agree there is that possible problem that several residents in Belgravia could rent out their driveway and uh, uh, make a decent amount of money every month on that. 
and it's going to be a bit of a problem for us. If enough people do it, we'll get a lot of traffic that we really don't want. Great. Okay, well, thanks. I wanted to ask that question because it was the one thing that left out at me that I was going to ask administration about, and I'll, I'll ask them that when I get to it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions uh, for Mr. Hokalak? Not seeing any. Um, thank you all for your thoughtful presentations. We'll now go to questions of administration. Uh, Councillor Henderson, you'd selected this, so go ahead. Yeah, well, I think you've heard my question, and it caught me a little bit by surprise uh, because we had, you know, it's a one, it's it's a it's a fairly major change getting rid of non-accessory parking. Um, and my real concern is, and I've heard it from quite a few of the neighborhoods, particularly around the university, where we've been, the university's been really working hard um, to keep traffic away from there um, by limiting parking. Uh, you know, for us to make it sort of, and, and we've had problems all the way along with, uh, with, with uh, unofficial non-accessory parking. Um, I know it's a problem around big event kinds of things as well, um, which seems to me, counterintuitive to what we're trying to do with this. Um, I, you know, I, and I'm absolutely supportive of the idea of being able to facilitate shared parking, but I'm really, really concerned that we're going to open up a hornet's nest that will be very hard to deal with um, without another way of approaching this. So your thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, our position as administration is that shared parking is um, a complementary piece to open option parking and so by getting rid of the distinction between accessory and non-accessory parking it does enable that um, that uh, market-based approach to alleviating uh, different parking uh, needs in different areas and uh, for you know things like alleviating potential on-street uh, parking where there can be some some off-street uh, solutions found um, I would like to just note, just just so that we're all on the same page, that um, there was th this uh, this part this part of the proposal um, was part of our, our earlier presentations and and, and earlier bylaw uh, markup. Um, but I will say that it's a big markup, and it's understandable if this is a, a piece that was uh, potentially overlooked. Um, and and further clarification to on. Um, um, sorry, I'll, I'll refer to Marcel as Marcel because I, I didn't um, I didn't catch his last name. Um, the the review that was or sorry the uh, the reference that was made to um, unlimited underground parking wasn't entirely correct, and and he may have been commenting on an earlier version of the bylaw. Again, um, understandable big bylaw. Um, so the 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 version that's in front of council today does put a maximum. On, uh, on underground parking for residential uses within 600 meters of an LRT station or transit center or 150 meters of a, a transit avenue or, main st or, or within the main streets overlay. Um, the unlimited underground parking yeah. opportunity is for commercial uh, uses. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, I'm more concerned about something we struggled with for years, which is the, the people basically in an area like the university, particularly on rental properties, turn their property into an unofficial parking lot. Um, and there'll be nothing, if we go ahead with the way we're doing this, there'll be nothing we can do to prevent that. Um, and I, and, and you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm support, I'm totally supportive of the idea of shared parking, but I, you know, we've been struggling against this and, and it will only make our traffic problems around the university worse. Um, and it will create, I think, a whole bunch of other real concerns in terms of Properties essentially being used for something that they're not designed for, which is which is which is parking rental, um, when they're meant to be residential properties. And I and I don't know how we protect against that if we get rid of the distinction around accessory versus non-accessory parking. The the proposed bylaw does have a limit of three uh, three spaces that could be rented out by a property in a residential zone. Um, anything more than that would fall into the, the category of a surface parking lot, which would not be permitted. Um, and uh, I, I would also just add that you know you know change is, is intended or changes is, is going to be gradual with this change, and um, I, we, this we can I, we can I, monitor. I question that. This 
I mean, I, I don't, I, this is exactly, I, I understand that somebody building something new, it will be gradual. This will happen overnight. And all of a sudden people will be able to add extra, use extra parking spots, convert their, convert their, their properties. And I, and I guarantee you it will happen overnight. It's happening already. And, and, and we've been having to try and do enforcement around it. So this will not be a gradual change. It'll be instant. Administration anyway, is time. administration Thanks. is happy, uh, Councillor, to um, follow this issue and monitor over the the next um, coming years. Um, we have an, uh, a zoning bylaw renewal coming coming up in in a couple of years' time, and if this is an issue that poses a problem, we're happy to deal with it through that. Okay, I'm out of time. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Essinger, then Councillor Katarina. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to confirm something that I heard. I think you said there is a review underway of the on-street parking program that's kind of parallel to what's been happening here. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And are you engaging communities in that as well? That was my question from some of my communities. Will they be able to speak into that? The review of the residential parking program will actually be preceded by um, uh, the formation of some policy work around principles for how we use our on-street parking resource. That work uh, has a strategic communications component to it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's it's something that is proposed to be fully engaged on as the, the we feel that we have the policy guidance already in place around um, from the draft city plan and, and Connect Edmonton and so on that lead us towards uh, what the corresponding on-street parking um, reaction would need to be. Okay, that was just their concern about going to the open parking, what would happen with that program, um, and so they really want to be engaged. So I, I will direct them your way if they have thoughts, if that's all right. That was my only question at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Katarina. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, something you just mentioned uh, when you were speaking to Councillor uh, Henderson, uh, three parking stalls are going to be allowed in residential areas to, to rent or, or, or be used by others. Is that, is that what I heard? Up to a, a resident would be through the shared parking mechanism, and a resident would be able to rent out up to three of their existing, or I shouldn't say existing necessarily, but the three of their uh, parking spaces on their site that are meant for the the house itself. Okay, so not necessarily parking. That, what I'm understanding you to say that uh, uh, you can park cars on front lawns. It doesn't have to be designated parking stall, doesn't have to be in a driveway, it can be anywhere on the property. No, Is that, that right? Uh, no, Councillor. There, there are other requirements around hard surfacing and maximum um, widths of driveways and so on that would prevent that from happening. Okay, so that, that I need a clarification on that. So in, in the uh, non-exclusive parking, and uh, again, Councillor Henderson had mentioned it, uh, so around Commonwealth Stadium with 45,000, 50,000 people attending and the overflow into the community, uh, there's never been uh, much enforcement, even though we've, uh, uh, with the community, have uh, asked for it. So what, what is the remedy uh, for uh, this, or is there a remedy in this bylaw uh, for uh, people not adhering to uh, more than the free parking uh, on the uh, on private property, for parking uh, at events uh, where you have no permit, uh, and all those sorts of things. Is there anything in this bylaw that uh, um, has some teeth that could actually enforce some of that overflow parking? And remember, we have uh, parking restrictions. You must be a resident. You must have a sticker. Uh, all those sorts of things. Yet, uh, it's been... In my recollection, uh, uh, being in the area, it's been like that for uh, 45, 50 years where there isn't much enforcement uh, uh, with those big events that go on at Commonwealth. 
Uh, sorry, Councillor, I missed the, the last part, but I can, I can respond to the, the first part of the question to begin with. Um, the, the zoning bylaw is one part of the equation, and how the city uh, deploys its, its uh, enforcement and its uh, on-street parking uh, management systems is another part of the equation. And, and I think I've just spoken to the on-street parking management approach and, and how that will need to evolve. Um, and as for enforcement, it, it is a question of, of often resources and, and whether or not it's, um, it is something that's causing a problem. Uh, and if this is something that's becoming a problem, it is something that we would have the opportunity to, uh, to take enforcement on. The, the zoning bylaw itself um, would not need to, to direct what that would be. I, I can also add that we do work closely with our enforcement colleagues. And so if there were um, challenges where um, a resident was perhaps renting out more spaces than they were allowed without a development permit, we could work with, we will and we do work with our enforcement colleagues to um, manage that. So I'm hearing that game days potentially are not meeting um, desired levels and that would be a question about resourcing, but we do have the tools to do that enforcement. Uh, the tools might be there, the policies might be there, but uh, my experience for many, many years is that uh, uh, we don't give it uh, much credence in, in enforcement. I've also been informed, Councillor, um, that a review of our enforcement resources will take place as a result of, or as part of the, um, the parking principles and guidelines around the use of on-street parking as well. Okay, well, that, uh, um, I'll... I'm happy to hear that. Uh, I'll be happier when I actually see it. Uh, we don't have to worry about it this year, uh, but uh, we'll see next year what happens. And just to uh, uh, the bylaw itself, I, I think that this is uh, uh, probably one of the bylaws that I'm more excited about, which I, I don't get very excited about bylaws. Uh, but uh, uh, having personal experience in uh, parking minimums uh, back in the 90s when uh, uh, in, in another life uh, as a restaurant owner, uh, trying to find enough parking for 120 seats when the requirement was one stall per table, one stall for four people, uh, 120, that required 30 parking stalls, and I had eight that, that were on site and had to uh, sign contracts with other building owners in the area for two parking stalls here or three there in order to meet the minimum requirement uh, that the city needed for that uh, size of restaurant, uh, which was ludicrous at the time, uh, but uh, it, it made things really, really uh, awkward. So I, I think that uh, this is actually a, a really good way to go and a, a really good start, but uh, just the flag that uh, if people might use this uh, uh, intent to 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 do things not quite properly or continue doing things that they shouldn't have been doing to start with, and that's the auxiliary parking that I hope we uh, uh, can wrestle. So, so Councillor, okay, time is up. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Okay, uh, I will interpret that as a don't you think because we're not speaking to it just yet till the public oh. hearing's closed, but... Um, yeah, I, w I won't be speaking to it, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll let you off the hook for that one. Understood. <laughs> Councillor McKean is next. Thank you. Followed by Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to know the rationale for allowing up to three parking stalls to be used on any residential lot, or any resident, yeah, residential lot. The rationale. The rationale for uh, the number three councillor or for um, allowing the, this in general? Uh, allowing it in general first and then the three. So in general, the idea um, of, uh, of enabling shared parking is um, we see it as a little bit of an all for or all or none kind of situation where the, um, the concept itself works best when applied across all different scales and, and use types. And, um, and there is a significant, um, as we've said you know, numerous times, a significant oversupply over of parking across Edmonton. And I think that there are situations where 
Um, we have residents that don't use their, their driveway for parking their own vehicle. Um, and so that, and then for, for the number three in particular, it's, um, it's not an exact science. It's really just that, you know, in consideration of the, the general size of a typical low density residential lot, that um, that seems to be the, the, the sort of tipping point between maybe not too few and, and not too many. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I can't support this, um, this policy anymore. And I would, the only way I'll support it, I think, is if I could amend it down to one parking stall for residential lot. You know, I know that Councillor Henderson's concerned about the university, but in the context of Ward 6 with Rogers Place, and with McEwen University and all the other institutions, medical and otherwise, um, I just, I've long said, residential neighborhoods should not be used as parking lots. So, and here we are opening them up in the parking lot. So, um, you, would you like some help with some wording around an amendment um, relative to the non-accessory use? A cap on the non-accessory use Please. in the Please. residential context, right? Yeah, I think there's, you know, uh, Mr. Mayor, I think there might be opportunities with churches or in and the some other situations. It's 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 about in low density, or because you were talking about per lot. Just want to get yeah, your intent clear so that they can draft something, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Mayor, I'm. I, feel compelled to point out that you're really probably doing quite a shift in policy and would likely have that to re-advertise re this. Yeah, especially if we're going down to one, you would impact every double wide, wide driveway in a residential zone, which is incredibly common. Okay, so um, that uh, noted that, that such an amendment would require re-advertising. Um, I think uh, uh, Councillor McKean will still want to uh, test the question though, I suspect. Um, so why don't I finish with other questions uh, and then come back to you, Councillor McKean, and you can work with the clerks uh, on a, some potential wording for an amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you for all of this. It's been a very, very interesting day so far. Um, just a couple quick questions, and maybe related to Councillor McKean's concerns. Um, I'm thinking about in my ward, uh, folks with disabilities or seniors who will have trouble walking maybe an extra block or two in the winter to access their home if uh, on-street parking becomes difficult to find, which already is in the case in some areas. So, I'm wondering if we're making it easier for people to apply for, you know, sort of that reserved space in front of their home. So, Councillor, the, um, the, the proposed change would enable uh, the flexibility of a property owner to continue to use their, their own parking um, as they normally would. Um, in areas where, uh, where they're, you know, potentially denser areas that you might be describing. Um, I, I believe that there is a, a review happening of our on-street um, accessible parking approach, and I'll just pause for a moment while I uh, get that answer. All right, yeah. The In concern is not personal parking, but the on-street parking, because that may be the only thing I should Councillor Paquette, we'll make sure uh, Ms. McCabe here to take that feedback as part of the review of the on-street program, which is an absolutely essential part of uh, having uh, open parking is to ensure that we've got a robust on-street program, which the team is already working on. So we'll take that feedback today. Thank you for that. All right. Yeah, just to remind you that as folks age up, it becomes quite an issue trying to navigate over icy main roads and the like. So my next question, sort of uh, along the lines of uh, Mr. McKean's concern, do we anticipate that if 
people are given the opportunity to sort of rent out their personal parking stalls on their property, that what they'll be doing is renting that space then moving their car on street and therefore causing greater congestion. And if that is the case, is there a way that the city can designate some area on each street for emergency access? So, Cal, so just on the first part of your question, the, um, this is an activity that, that we're aware is currently happening today on an informal basis, the renting out of, of um, one's driveway for uh, another user. And it's, um, it's something that uh, we're not necessarily expecting to occur en masse. I think that there will still be a lot of demand for residents to use their own driveways and use their own parking spaces on their property. So if it is something that that becomes an issue, uh, it is something that we would be pleased to um, follow up on through the zoning bylaw renewal. Councillor Paquette, it, this is something that we'll absolutely have to take an eye on uh, through the zoning bylaw renewal uh, project. The idea is that if we are um, going to enable shared use, shared space uh, through the zoning bylaw, this is the, the way to put that in that and in the way to allow for it. It does require us as a city to look at risk differently. Uh, for us to uh, then look at compliance as well as the on-street parking programs. And that's what we've said uh, when we were at committee, that this isn't just, uh, this needs to be a corporate approach in terms of our implementation. So we enable it through the bylaw, and then we can't just leave it. We need to work corporately uh, to make sure that we implement this in a very thoughtful approach. Which I can okay. tell you, our executive yeah. leadership team is committed to implementing this, having a, a thoughtful ap approach ac across the corporation. Thank you. And then the concept of uh, periodically having sort of emergency access on, on streets. So emergency access is absolutely a critical, important to neighbor, a critically important part to neighborhood design, and that uh, is dictated often through the the width of our roadways to make sure that the the fire trucks can get through. And we definitely work with fire on a regular basis to understand those trade offs as we're do, uh, as we're looking at a neighborhood. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, understanding that there's going to be a um, periodic review of this. This isn't just something that's done and forgotten about. This is not something that will be done and forgotten about. This is absolutely something that needs a thoughtful approach. And because it is incremental change as it, as it gets implemented, uh, that we will have to continue to look at the data and then understand how we adjust what the appropriate tool is to use uh, to create the types of neighborhoods that we are looking to create uh, in our city. So sometimes that appropriate tool will be the zoning bylaw, and sometimes that appropriate tool is going to be compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cartmill, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just along the same lines, I'm wondering if... Uh, distinction can be made depending upon the zoning of the property. So uh, not allowing uh, renting out of driveway space on uh, properties that are zoned RF1, RF3, and the like, but allowing uh, the renting out of stalls on properties that, you know, as Councillor McKean suggested, the church parking lot. So institutional, urban services, municipal reserve type zones that perhaps a little bit more conducive to mass parking. Um, again, just building on the idea that there are park at pockets of the city where a car in every driveway could result, not necessarily out in the suburbs, however. Is there, it, would that be something that is, uh, if an amendment was made on that basis, is that manageable from a enforcement or uh, bylaw perspective? I think if it were council's will, councillor, we could make it work. Um, it's it's certainly not um, something that we would be uh, hoping to to get into at this point, due to the difficulty in um, you know expectation management across uh, the, the the city. I think that it, it potentially lends itself to confusion, where people might not understand the, the places where this would and would not be permitted. Um, but the mechanics of it, we could probably find a way. 
Well, I appreciate that. I, I guess my thought is that if it's not the, if it's not your personal driveway or a driveway in front of or behind a, a single family home, but it could be the community league parking lot, it could be the church parking lot, it could be the multi unit residential next to the commercial strip, that that becomes relatively intuitive for most people most of the time. Exactly. Don't you think? I, yeah. I, I do you. think. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, let's finish with questions. Uh, I need a motion for a second round. I'll move a second round. Thank you, Councillor Knack. I'll second. second that. Or Councillor Carmel seconds that. Okay, great. I'll just seek unanimous consent for the second round. Is there any objection? We're closing in on 5.30 here, so we'll also need... Uh, direction about orders of the day here in a few minutes but uh, we'll carry on with the second round for now uh, starting with Councillor Henderson and then Councillor McKean with further questions. Councillor Henderson go ahead. Um, well I, I'm, I'm just wondering what some of the options are here because I because I, I suspect this is locational. Um, it really is only an issue where where you have uh, almost intentionally around a university around a stadium around you know where where um, where you have a different kind of demand. Um, so I, I just want you know I don't want to slow this down. We've been working on this for a long time, but this does seem to me a glitch. And um, so I'm trying to think of a way through this that can allow us to get going with the majority of this, which I think is um, we need to get on with without creating this unintended consequence. So. I, are there any ideas? I mean, I don't know if it'd be. I don't know if there's something we could do with business licensing. Um, I, you know, I recognize that I. I don't think there's a clean, easy way to do an amendment on what you brought forward. Um, I don't know. If there's something we can do with overlays. Um, any thoughts? You know, cause maybe we could do it and ask you to come back with an overlay that will that will close the part that we're opening here. Um, any thought to that? Uh, I'll ask uh, Lila Peter to respond to whether there's any other potential business licensing or, or otherwise um, options. What I would start off with is this is a big change and we know that we have to evaluate this amendment. And it does sound like there is some hesitation about some of the um, permissions that are being enabled through this, ch through this bylaw change. And I think it's important that we always have the ability to reflect, review, monitor and come back with changes. And it really sounds like we want to do that. And I think that we as administration can commit to taking some time to look at how this impacts neighborhoods. And if we find that there is an impact, we can definitely come back with a future bylaw change. So we can run with it for now and potentially come back with a bylaw change going forward. In terms of business licensing, um, it would be a policy decision as to whether or not we would require a business license for this uh, work, for, for renting out spaces. However, we couldn't, um, we wouldn't be circulating to neighborhoods, so it would just become, you would apply for it and get it, and if you didn't have one, it would be a ticket. So it's not necessarily something that creates that um, oversight that I feel like um, council members are looking for. It would be more of a, you purchase your business license and you're good to go. But I would suggest that perhaps we monitor the situation. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but the problem is not about enforcement. If we remove this, there'll be nothing to enforce. Um, anybody could do this and would be completely compliant. And we'd have no way to do enforcement around it, except if they went over the number of three. And I'm looking in the bylaw to see where where does the three spots come from? Because I'm not, I didn't, I, I, it's a huge piece of work, I realize. I was trying to dig that out of the bylaw, but what limits it, where is it limited to three? It's a tie-in with the definition of a surface parking lot counselor. Uh, so after, after three, uh, you, the activity would uh, shift into the category of surface parking, in which case it would need to be permitted in that zone for, for a standalone surface so, parking lot. But how does that work with an RA7 where they're going to have more than three spots to begin with? You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit confused and lost here, I confess, right? Because an RA7, you know, you theoretically could, uh, you know, and this back, goes back to Mr. Huckalock's point, you know, there's nothing, once you put it in as it used to go with a residential, um, 
there are going to be some situations where there's going to be a lot more than three spaces available. In, in those cases, it wouldn't, uh, it, you know, if we're talking about, say, an, an apartment building with underground parking, um, it would be an underground parkade, uh, so it wouldn't be bound by that. parking, RA7, it might be surface. So in the case of it, it being a surface parking uh, situation where there wasn't um, that, that use, the vehicle parking use wasn't permitted or discretionary in that zone, um, then it would not be permitted. But, but we would be permitting the parking because we're not distinguishing between accessory and non-accessory. So an apartment building that has a parking lot on the surface, um, it would be a permitted use. It would be permitted. Uh, the, Correct. It would be permitted for use by the building itself, but the act of renting out the additional spaces wouldn't be permitted. Where? So where is that? Where is that? Unper but if we're not distinguishing between accessory and non-accessory, how would we make that distinction? Um, again, councillor, it falls back to the the definition of uh, a surface parking lot and this cap of three. Um, so this is this is a. Uh, uh, a quirk of the the approach um, that in order to cap it for the low density situations, um, these uh, these types of situations fall into it. So we would um, it would not be permitted in that case. Then, then now now I'm getting more confused because I thought the whole point was to allow, for instance, a business that might. I mean, even the example you used in your in your presentation. Showed a, showed a parking lot that was substantially more than three that could share between businesses, but it, right? So how would it even allow for the, the one thing we're trying to achieve here? Sorry, Councillor, let me take a minute and check my facts here. One thing I would um, point to is that this bylaw is meant to enable some flexibility and some choice and to continue to um, better use the resources that we have put into place. And so um, I recognize that there is some fear about potentially using existing parking spaces and bringing um, vehicles into a neighborhood um, to use those spaces. But if those spaces are not being used by the landowner, then this does create an opportunity to better use that land. And I guess the question is, is that is it on the small residential sites? Is it on residential sites? Or, because we're starting to hear that there are some um, situations where it might be okay. And so it, it would be, you know, when is it not okay? And what is that difference, I guess? I, I, I think, it, I think, you know, I'm actually out of time, but I just really quickly, I think problem is in situations where limited parking capacity. I'm, I'm afraid I'm afraid you're out of time and also completely inaudible, Councillor. I'm not sure what's happening to our connection, but um, I'll go to Councillor McKean next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am really confused. Um, so maybe somebody could explain to me the philosophy behind this particular move in the bylaw. Uh, we were, you, we were uh, reducing parking requirements so that we would stimulate, uh, in large part, we would stimulate development in residential areas and certainly in the commercial areas so we could get more 124th Street, more White Avenue. And then, as part of that, we've now opened up residential parking or, or parking on residential single family lots. Some, can somebody explain to me how that philosophy fits together? The, um, the approach to shared parking is a, a complementary piece to open option parking. So this is, this is something that um, in, in taking a market-based approach to the, the use of our um, existing oversupply of parking in Edmonton, this is, a, this is a part of that. This enables people to use their existing supply uh, and to fill a need where that need exists. We have an oversupply of parking, and then we're going to open up more opportunities for parking. 
parking in residential areas. This is where, you know, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, if I had my druthers, I would punt this down the road by a couple of months and and get some more uh, work done on this at the community level because I'm frankly, and, and, and you know, I uh, quote Mr. Summers, uh, that what we're doing right now is stupid. Well, this, um, I don't know if this is stupid, but it strikes me as um, really not fitting with the goals of this program. I'm really, I can't support this bylaw, and I really thought I could support this bylaw. Councillor McKean, one of the uh, concepts that we were thinking about when we were talking about shared parking was also allowing the opportunity for, uh, a sing if you had a single family home and your neighbour uh, redeveloped the site for a suite, uh, a garage suite and a garden suite or a, a secondary suite and needed some additional parking, there's an opportunity to share that parking with your neighbour. It wasn't necessarily about facilitating you know, special event parking and that sort of thing. We recognise that is a risk. Um, however, we can monitor and review this over the coming times, and if we need to make some changes, we can accommodate that through the zoning bylaw renewal project, which will come before council uh, within two years. I don't know why the state would have any interest in that relationship. Sorry, we didn't quite catch that, councillor. Can you say that again? I said I don't know why the state, the municipality, we have an interest in a relationship between neighbors. Ms. Petron, I think that was you. Sorry, Councillor McKean, I, I didn't quite catch your question. It's breaking up. Uh, yeah, sorry. So slow. Um, that, that what you just described couldn't happen informally already. That's correct. Right. Well, um, I frankly don't know what to do here. I guess I have the op option of voting no. Doesn't feel very satisfactory because I do support a lot of this bylaw, uh, which our speakers in support came out to, to describe why it's important. But I, I see a flaw here that I find really annoying, Mr. Mayor. So. Unless you have some way to help me out. If I could offer Councillor McKean, you know, often in zoning, what we do is we'd be very careful that we don't go down a road we can't come back from because we create development permits that are then as of right and remain as non conforming on land. That isn't the case here with this issue. What this is would be, would allow this uh, um, issue to arise if it does without the use of development permits, which means that if there's a problem in a matter of months and it has to be solved, those people don't, as of right, get to carry on with that loophole if that's what it becomes. So it is a bit unique in that regard in that it would allow for a correction if it was needed and to stop the problem instead of allow it where it was already started, which is the normal issue we run into. Because it's enabling rather than restricting yeah, in person, the first place. Uh, an we individual can come back in and regulate exactly. down if it's not working, which we could... Because an individual doesn't need a development permit to use this right that's being granted, you could stop it at any point. If that helps. Um, Councillor Knack. Uh, oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, Mr. Johnson just said exactly what I was about to ask. So that, that to me, and so I, I, maybe one follow-up is there's nothing stopping us from then having a report back even six months from now. We could do that just in case. If, if there, because I, I get that there's a couple of areas, there's a couple of pockets where there is potential for something to go awry. So we could come back in six months. There could be a subsequent motion on that. Is that fair? Yes, Councillor Knack, we could come back in six months on it, and we could come back as part of our annual report on the zoning bylaw, which we're using to inform the zoning bylaw renewal. And it's it would, absolutely no problem. And it would be fairly easy to then, if we needed to, again, if we found in a couple of these areas there was something unique that was occurring that needed special attention, this, this wouldn't have to be a, a long process to fix it. If it came back in six months, we could put something in within a month or two with that. This is exactly the type of uh, regulation where we can be agile uh, in okay. our approach. Great. That, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else with questions? Okay. I think we have um, three options. One is to attempt to amend. That will trigger re-advertising anyway, we understand. 
Second would be to refer, um, uh, entertain a motion to refer, and if that, which sort of tests where we're at, if that passes, then, then the referral work happens uh, and it comes back later. Uh, if referral fails, then the uh, question would be put today. Um, uh, third is we just vote on it as it is, understanding that there'll be a subsequent about monitoring and that the, this issue can be tightened up uh, quickly if, if needs be, uh, based on further reflection. Um, and that subsequent can apply in either the referral fails scenario or it could be the basis of the referral. So those are really your options. Um, I, th I think ref if there's a will to make changes to this before dealing with the bylaw, referrals better than amendment on the floor given that it requires re-advertising and given the, just the difficulty of trying to draft that on the fly. So um, I think there's been some comfort given here about the ability to adjust this easily if, if it's not working the way we want and to do so quickly. Uh, so a subsequent motion could um, lead to both monitoring and, uh, uh, and a further policy discussion on this at the time uh, of Council's choosing, three months, six months, 12 months, 18, whatever you want. Um, so um, I guess it really does fall to Council. My, my sense is that it's not a fatal flaw in the short term. If it, if it is, does need to be reconsidered, it would manifest over time and, and that we can catch that with a subsequent motion. So I'll go out on a limb here and suggest that I think we should, uh, uh, we could perhaps build the subsequent motion um, informally here to make sure that you had some comfort of what that, what that was gonna be before voting on um, the main question. Um, but if there is a motion to refer to ask for that additional analysis, um, now would be the time. Mr. Mayor? Yep, yeah, Councilor McKean. I am suffering Zoom fatigue, which I gather is real. Um, I take your advice. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm hoping that I think I see Pastor Knack working away on a subsequent, uh, which um, is the least. Uh, this is the least satisfactory option for me. But uh, there's been people working on this, and we've had some really good submissions on this. And I don't want to disappoint all those people who came out today by punting this down the road by three months. So. I think your your advice is wise. Oh, thanks. No one ever says that. Um, <laughs> I'm having the fatigues as well. So, um, um, okay, let's just see if we have a sense of what the uh, subsequent would be and then I'll call for new information. Um. Mr. Mayor, I had put one into the, as a suggestion, uh, I texted it out. Yeah, um, I, I saw that in the I chat. I can read it I, out of that, Cecil. I, uh, I'm not sure it's correct, but, uh, but, I, but I thought it might be a way that would allow us to move forward. And I actually think probably I put one year in there, but probably the administration return in, I'll leave the length of time we can leave open, the analysis of how the removal of non-accessory parking as a restriction has affected communities like those around the university and other high demand parking areas. Because I actually do think this is locational. I understand completely, you know, for most of the city, um, this is uh, it's not going to be a problem and will probably be a help. But I do think we have some special cases that need to be understood in a different way. Is that, did you have something else going, Councillor Knack, or is that, does that work for you? Okay, so that would be, uh, and sorry, what was the timeline you suggested? Six months then? Or? I had put one year, but I think probably it needs to be quicker on because I think we do need analysis on, I think this is going to happen quickly. And, uh, and I think we need some analysis back. And I, you know, it's as much to think about how we could carve these areas out as anything else. 
Uh, maybe it's not about getting the analysis back. Maybe I've got the wrong subsequent. Maybe it's about asking them to go back and look at this issue and come back with possible solutions. I'll go to uh, Ms. McCabe and co for advice on uh, for further thoughts on what you think would al allow us, you, you hear the concern that's flagged, how would this fit into your work plan timeline, construction season, et cetera, et cetera, when would be a reasonable timeline for us to re-engage on this question? So we probably bring it back with our next um, annual update on the zoning bylaw, and I'll just need to find out from the team when we could bring that back. The we next uh, check-in on the zoning bylaw renewal would be due for uh, January of 21. But that would be in advance of next year's construction season. That's in effect six-ish months from now, less with report lead times and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's in about half a year, and it's not during budget and 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 uh, end of year shenanigans. So January at committee, would that be a satisfactory due date? And uh, yes, that would be. I, I see suggestion around listing uh, Commonwealth and Rogers as uh, <laughs> as uh, hot spots as well. We could take a look at all of the spots uh, in terms of where the major events occur. And I would also say that during COVID, there are limited major events happening. So I think that we've got some time uh, by next summer mm -hmm. to, to figure this out as well. So January seems like a, a reasonable time that we still capture the construction season. Uh, and perhaps in 2021, we're uh, more into a, a regular special events season. Okay. Okay, so that's... Mr. Mayor. Yeah, uh, sorry, let me just, uh, I was still on Councillor Henderson there to see if all of those are friendly adjustments to build into a possible subsequent uh, and a timeline. Yes, I think so, and I'm also thinking, if yeah, timeline's fine, I, I also think we should probably add into it, because I'm not sure I've got it quite right, that we should probably add in and solutions on how to mitigate those effects. Um, so it's not just to report back on what happens, that there actually is some thought about how we can respond. Some some analysis on this on this question uh, of risk around an abundance of non accessory um, offsite. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I think we could take some time to build that. I think the intent is relatively clear, and administration can put it into language that is consistent with the zoning bylaw and the issue as they understand it. And then we'd be in a position to test that. But the intent would clearly be to check in. Uh, in the context of the zoning bylaw review, um, uh, which puts it in a broader context, allows it to come back with a piece of work that's already coming, and that that would be uh, uh, first first up in early 2021. So, um, okay. Second. <laughs> well, great. We'll, it'll be subsequent. So we'll we'll so do we can, we'll we do that we'll do that after correct. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that if. Uh, well, I guess what we can do is we can check new information, um, check um, uh, first reading, and if first reading uh, fails, then we can refer the whole question back on this basis. If first reading passes uh, and, and all of the other by uh, readings pass, um, then we can uh, deal with this a question as a subsequent motion at that time and then conclude this meeting. Now we are about 12 minutes over, so I'm going to ask for a motion to extend to complete uh, our deliberations on 322. So moved. Thank you. Second. Mack, seconded by Councillor Henderson. Um, please vote. And then we'll see. Yes. Still need some advice before yes. we go. Thank you on what to do with when you want to convene the other meeting. Technically, it would start at 7 at this point unless we give other directions, so, uh, which we may or may not want to do. It's up to you. But on the question of extending orders for this meeting to finish this item, including the subsequent if necessary, please vote. Have we got all the votes? Short one.
to believe we have more than 13 now. Okay, display as many votes as you got. Uh, that's carried unanimously to simply to extend orders. Now, um, sorry, Councillor McKean, did you have uh, something else? Yeah, I just uh, was talking to see Roger's place. Um, I, I don't think I'll see in the queue in, but uh, although that has it back too, but um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure the Rogers Place Commonwealth Stadium were included. And I think that has been added in, in a friendly way to the subsequent. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, the activity nodes can be enumerated um, if, that's, if that's helpful. We'll, and we'll uh, see if we can get some wording put together on that while we uh, consider the bylaws themselves, if it is uh, the will of council to proceed with those, which we'll test in a moment. But what I, what I should do now then, if there's nobody else with process questions or technical questions, not seeing any, is uh, check with our registered speakers to see if there's any new information. Not seeing or hearing any new information from the speakers, then... Uh, Mr. Mayor, I can move closure of the public hearing. Councillor Knack has moved it. I'll second it. Please vote on closure of the public hearing. Yes. We have 13 votes. Display the vote, please. That's carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move first reading of item 3.22. Second. Anyone wishing to speak to it? Mr. Mayor, yes, please. Councillor Henderson. Uh, uh, Councillor Henderson. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm with some nervousness. Uh, I'm going to support this because I like 90 percent of what's in here and think. And we've talked. We talked about it for a long time. Um, and I think we do need to get on with it. And it's why I wish I had a better answer for how to deal with what I think is a glitch that we do need to deal with. Um, I'm nervous um, that we will see. Um, that this is actually, ironically, this glitch will actually see things that move faster, not slower. Um, but understanding that we will have a chance to go back and look at that again and work on it. Um, I, I just, I'm really, you know, I think under the circumstances, I would say the best way to do this would be send it back and get We've had a lot of this. Um, and I think it's time to get on with it because I think it will affect things going forward. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, and it, and if we, if this was in the report that we had at, um, uh, at, uh, at, at committee, I don't remember it there. I don't remember to talk about getting rid of non accessory because I think I would have flagged it. Um, but I think there's, you know, for me, there's a, and maybe it's part of the nature of, of the way we're functioning right now is we might have caught this in times when we were actually able to all be in the same place, but this, uh, this seems an unfortunate way to go by doing it, but I don't want to slow it down. So I will support this with the strong underlining that I'm completely supportive of the idea of the shared parking. And I think we need to be able to facilitate that. But I do think there's going to be some un unintended consequences in some certain areas that will be counter to what our intent was in doing this. And, uh, and I really hope we can go back and fix those um, as part of a subsequent piece of work. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Cartmel. I think Councillor Knack was ahead of me. He's to close. So go ahead. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. My apologies. I, I just wanted to say that uh, I uh, echo what Councillor Henderson said, that this, uh, this part of the uh, bylaw, the successory uh, parking part of it, uh, didn't seem to have come up at committee when we talked about this at least a couple of times, and that uh, you know, that is a bit of the surprising part of it. But I will say that we did talk about this, uh, in the, the broader bylaw and the, and the set of uh, decisions that we're making here today in a lot of detail at committee. And uh, while there was hesitation perhaps at the first meeting, we had a lot of submissions, a lot of discussion. And uh, by the end of uh, the last discussion on this, uh, 
it felt very much to me like administration had considered most of, if not all of what we were presenting in committee and uh, had uh, approaches and had uh, strategies to deal with virtually everything that was brought forward. So I just want to say that this was a really good piece of work. It was, it was duly considered and there was really strong discussions and arguments presented by administration when we did talk about this uh, last time through. So happy to support these bylaws knowing that there's a subsequent calling, uh, subsequent coming uh, that will attend to this one little piece. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McKean. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Parking has always been a big issue in the ward I represent because there's downtown, um, there's the Royal Alex Hospital, there's uh, McEwen University, and then we added in Rogers Place and, and of course, Commonwealth Stadium as well. And Professor Katarina has talked eloquently in the past about the problems that occur in, in Macaulay and other close by neighborhoods on, on a game night. I am really, I find myself really frustrated here because this was not a uh, well uh, discussed, debated question in the past, this non accessory uh, part of this uh, bylaw. And, and, uh, um, and I think it's really interesting. I think to me, maybe I'm seeing it wrong and that's totally possible, but we seem to have contradictory philosophies within this. And, um, and I don't get that, to be honest. I think all our speakers talk about how uh, reducing parking restrictions would act as a stimulus for, for both residential and commercial areas. And so, I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm not happy, and I think opening, opening the barn door, uh, which this will do in residential areas for parking here and there and anywhere during uh, major stadium events or in and around uh, uh, post-secondary campuses and hospitals where there are a lot of employees. I, I see this as a concern, and I'm, I'm, I, I know how much enforcement was done on, on game nights at Rogers Place and how new parking lots started to appear in the realm. It's a really complex, convoluted um, part of the realm parking is, and I'm, I'm not happy doing this at, the, at sort of the 11th hour, and so I will not be able to, and I, I don't like this, but I'm not able to support the bylaw today because I see it as a really concerning part of, uh, part of the regulations that we're allowing non-accessory parking. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I understand the concerns that were expressed. Um, I will be supporting this. Um, just for the, you know, I understand the concern, but I also think that uh, in some cases, there is absolutely no way to have all the answers before we proceed. It's, it's through action that we will get the learnings we need to, to um, refine some of our decisions, and I believe this is one of those cases. Um, and I don't know what it will look like, and maybe everything will turn out fine. Maybe we will discover where the friction points are and be able to adjust accordingly. And maybe it looks like uh, different zones. Um, I have no idea, but I do know that this is a good idea. Um, we've had very... Uh, little opposition to it, if any, from uh, almost every profession that's come to speak to us who are directly impacted by this decision. And one thing that I would say is that by moving in this direction, the other thing that we should keep at front of mind in the rest of our decisions going forward in our time on council is uh, creating a city that it's not so dependent on cars as a means of adequate transportation. And uh, that will only serve to save us money. It will only serve to improve uh, the lives of Edmontonians. So um, if this is one of those steps toward doing that, I am absolutely in favor, and I believe it is. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh Anybody else before I go to Councillor Knack? 
Um, got a couple thoughts. I guess I'll pass the chair to Councillor Paquette since ranking not present. Um, I so count, thank you. Um, I'll try not to take the full five minutes because I know it's late, but I think, um, you know, this, we've talked about this a lot, but it does bear mentioning that uh, this is a significant red tape reduction when it comes to the regulatory regime around developing anything in our city. Um, and it's the, the point that was made earlier, I think by Mr. Hoyt and has been, been made by any, many others is that our greatest streets are unbuildable under the laws as they exist for the next seven minutes, give or take. Um, and so the chance to give the streets and, and the land back to great buildings and space for people moving around them primarily, rather than dedicating as a regulatory requirement, huge amounts of land and cost to uh, an automatic expectation that there must be vehicles. And then having to, even worse than that, try to wade through all of the exceptions in a fair and equitable way to restaurateurs, retailers, and others trying to make these historic streets, as well as new streets we might try to build at a human scale, work. Um, that, that the attempt to reverse engineer um, car dominance, frankly, onto the best parts of the city has created no end of inequity and hardship for um, landlords in those areas. That said, it's still a very real and practical challenge for uh, tenants and employers and, and residents and, and landowners to get customers and employees in and out of these congested areas, but that is the sign of life in a great city. That is a good problem to have. If you have a small urban dashboard, um, having to deal with a lot of people wanting to come to an area is a really, really good problem to have, except maybe in a pandemic. But setting that uh, issue aside, um, this is a, an, a, a, an opportunity for us to support affordability, streamline the regulatory process, um, and really unleash some great creativity about how people can solve these problems of mobility, not just parking, but integrated mobility uh, through travel demand management, uh, through opportunities to uh, support people taking up different modes uh, of travel besides automobile dependency. Uh, and I think it's, it's noteworthy and perhaps a bit unexpected in the Canadian context for Edmonton to be the first place to do this in the country. And we don't say that often, and, and I don't think we're being um, overly ambitious in doing this, having spent five years studying the heck out of it. Uh, I'm pretty sure we've got it not perfect, but close enough to go ahead. And if we go now, it may be a benefit to this construction season, though it's already getting a bit late. Um, uh, but that said, I think if we can send this confidence signal to market, that is, even if it's for things that get built in subsequent years, that's going to be um, hugely helpful for projects that are even in the planning cycle right now or even in the, the conceptual um, land acquisition stage right now. And if that unlocks the kind of transit-oriented development and human-centered design that has been a part of all of our aspirations for not just the zoning bylaw, but the city plan and the city strategic plan. Uh, that supports those public health outcomes, that supports those economic drivers, that supports the, eco the environmental goals that our city has. So this is actually a pretty significant and positive shift that aligns with the, the city's uh, overall strategic goal and is very consistent with um, uh, commitments I've made about the city I want to see us build more of. So um, with gratitude for tremendous amount of engagement uh, with the public and with industry on this uh, and, and council's very thoughtful uh, work on this over the years, uh, I hope we'll be able to make this move, take some Canadian leadership and send a signal of confidence to uh, our investors that we really want to see them do new and cool things and make that easier for them to do as well. So. Um, I'll leave it there, take the chair back. I return the chair. And go to Councillor Knack to close. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, again, just want to start by thanking uh, all, all the members of administration who helped develop this plan. Uh, and I know while she's not necessarily part of our administration anymore, I feel like I should also give a shout out to Ann Stevenson, who, who helped uh, do some of that work as well. So uh, thank you, Ann, for, for your work and to everyone else for, for where we're at today. And for me, I think with the exception of the very specific areas that I think are going to be addressed through the subsequent motion, this is actually a, a really major change that will likely have a very limited immediate impact on those people's lives, which is a really weird way to look at it. Uh, but for, I think this is going to have that significant impact on those, on, for those who want to make different choices about where they're gonna live and how they wanna move throughout the city. And you know, I don't think, and why I talk about it's fairly limited impact is because I think about my home neighborhood. I live in a mature neighborhood of Jasper Park. We're you know pretty close to the core, and yet, and so because we're close to the core and beside uh, great transit access, uh, people could apply for parking variances, and yet, pretty much every new home in my neighborhood is getting built with a two-car garage. Why? Because I think that's what the market really asks for in that area, and so a lot of the folks building homes are, are doing it with that in mind. Um, similarly, I think about new communities right now, and, and this was touched on earlier, that you know, if you have those large suburban shopping centers that have been built you know, time and time again, we're not gonna see those transfer overnight. We're not gonna see somebody build one of those and add no new parking at all, uh, and just ask everyone to, to walk or cycle to that because we built a lot of those new neighborhoods that uh, are fairly car dependent. So I, I'm really not worried about us um, having some big negative impact, again, recognizing that there's maybe a few select areas that have some specific concerns that we can keep a very close eye on and adapt accordingly. Um, you know, I look at this and I think about some of the opportunities that do exist, whether it's for uh, a senior who's aging in their community and, and they want to build a garden suite in the back of their home, that's all on ground level without any having, without any worry about putting anything on a second floor, it makes that that much easier to finally do something like that. So they could downsize into a fully accessible home on the exact same lot that they raised their entire family on. And those are the type of opportunities that exist by, by providing some flexibility. Uh, it, it also provides flexibility on some of those larger, more complex projects and, and maybe some of the commercial shopping areas. But, to me, this is just all about giving people the choice. This is a good free market solution to let people go in and, and decide what works best for them. And, uh, and so I'm very, very excited about this, even knowing it it's might not have a, a major impact on most people. And then on top of that, I mean, I think, you know, I've, I've, if everyone can get ready, I always love to talk about autonomous vehicles when we're talking about parking. I, I do think we, we can't forget about the impact of, of evolving technology and how that's gonna change how we move throughout our cities. And it's nice to have a framework in place that can now uh, recognize that we'll evolve and technology and how we move will evolve. So it's great to have something ready in place. So I'm very excited about this. I'm gonna happily support it and, uh, and look forward to seeing uh, communities where people now have more choices available to them than they did uh, you know, maybe a few minutes ago. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote on first reading. Yes. We have 13 votes. Thank you, display the vote. And that's carried 12 to one. I'll move second reading of item 3.22. Thank you, I'll second that. On second reading, please vote. Yes. We have 13. Thank you, display the vote. Also carried uh, 12 to one. I'll move consideration of third reading on item 3.22. Second. Please vote to allow third reading to proceed. Yes. We 
We have 13. Thank you. Display the vote. That's carried. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I will move uh, third and final reading is this uh, Charter Bylaw 19275. I'll second that. Um, please vote on third reading. Yes. We have 12 just missing you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, put it down as yes, please. Sorry, I thought I hit go. Display the vote. And that's, that one's carried unanimously. The third reading. Councillor McKean, did you mean to vote no on that one? Mr. Mayor, I registered my protest votes earlier, but wanted to support the overall goals of the bylaw. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Got it. So uh, that third reading passes unanimously. Uh, Councillor, who's moving the subsequent? Councillor Henderson? I have it here. Okay. Go ahead. Um, uh, the wording that's being proposed is that administration examine the impacts of how the opportunity of shared parking has affected communities like those around the University of Alberta, Commonwealth Place, Rogers Place, and other high demand parking areas and return with recommendations on amendments if necessary. I'm a little, little bit nervous about adding that if necessary, but I'm obviously if they're not necessary, we wouldn't make the changes, but I will, I will let it stand. I think we've made the point, so I will trust that that will get us what we need. And Councillor McKean wishes to second that, I understand. Especially if it's called Commonwealth Stadium, not at Commonwealth Place. Okay. Noted and you, uh, Commonwealth Stadium. Stadium. Sorry, I'm reading it off what was given to me. Okay, that's okay, and we can make a friendly adjustment to Commonwealth Stadium. Um, the uh, and and do you want it noted that this will come back with the zoning bylaw report? Does that make life easier for due date January there? 2021 is uh, is what's on what's being recommended. Yeah, and so if we can just put in the motion also with the zoning bylaw sure. work plan update, then that'll just reduce the number of reports that to get generated over all this can be integrated. So, so uh, with those two friendly adjustments to the motion, um, anyone wishing to speak to um, the subsequent motion? Well, maybe just to introduce it quickly, because I, I feel bad. I, you know, I, I feel like we could have caught this earlier. I actually did pull up the previous report um, and the wording of it. And in actual fact, we didn't erase the definition of non-accessory parking in that, although it did change its definition. So I recognize in some ways we could have seen this before. But I think, you know, I think there's just a, you know, there's a, a lesson here on how we move forward on this. And I, you know, and the communities did flag it for me um, and perhaps, uh, and, and, and my response was, well, I, that's not what we're changing. So, um, and I was clearly in error. Um, so I think there, you know, I don't know how we protect against this in the future. I realize this is a remarkably complex document, but, uh, um, you know, I think there probably was a, another way to get at this that would have given us all more comfort, and that's the kind of learning for me. Um, but I hopefully this will get us to the same place ultimately, and in the meantime, uh, no, no real damage will be done. Thank you. Any other comments on the subsequent? Not seeing any, then please vote. Yes. We have 13 votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, please display the vote. That's carried unanimously. All right. Um, uh, before I call for notices, um, if we take no action, the council meeting would not reconvene until seven, which if you want to take a 50 minute break is, would be the default, uh, or we can take a few minutes and then power through because I think it will be fairly quick, but that assumes administration is ready to go if we're ready to go. Okay. Um, so um, this being a council meeting, we could take a motion to change the orders for the other council meeting, right? No? No, no, but if I adjourn this meeting, then I can't change the orders of the day for the other meeting, 
right? But is it, in, is it a continuation of yesterday's meeting or is it the balance of today's meeting? It's a continuation of yesterday's. So I have to change or I have, why don't, why don't we take a 90 second recess here just so we can process wise get on the same page. So a uh, quick recess before we adjourn this meeting because it may require a motion or it may not, I don't know. that the uh, items remaining from council yesterday will be brief. Maybe everyone left because I said 90 minute second reason. Okay, well let's, we're gonna design up something that allows us the option to continue in 10 minutes instead of 50. So just please stand by. Is everyone still there from council? So uh, the um, interpretation from the clerks is that the intent to resume as soon as this was uh, over overrides the, um, uh, that the, that intent overrides the, um, um, the normal orders of the day as outlined in the procedures bylaw. Therefore, uh, unless there's an objection, what I'm going to do is call for notices and adjourn this meeting and then I'm going to call the council meeting back to order continuing from yesterday uh, at uh, 6.25. So as long as no one objects to that at that time, um, we won't have an issue. So um, if anyone does though, then I quit. Um, so <laughs> all right, uh, are there any notices of motion today? Not hearing any, then the public hearing is adjourned. Uh, please switch off WebEx and go back to the uh, Hangout in your calendar or the Google Meet because we will use that uh, to uh, reconvene in about 12 minutes.
working on, so we'll be live in a few minutes. Councillor Nicola, is that you? Yeah. Okie dokes, we haven't started yet though. Just thank you. is good. There's tomato juice in the fridge. What? This? Okay, 625, let's do this. I will call this uh, continuation of yesterday's council meeting back to order um, based on 10 minutes or so after the continuation of yesterday or of the public hearing. So I will um, now do roll call starting with uh, Councillor Nickel. Councilor Nicole, are you there? Okay, I'll check again at the end. Councilor Paquette? Present. Welcome back. Councilor Walters? I'm here, sir. Super duper. Councilor Banga? Councilor Banga? How about Councilor Carmel?
Councilor Carmel, are you there? Uh, Councilor Katarina? I'm here. Welcome back. Councilor Zadek? Here, present. Welcome. Councilor Etzinger? Still here. Great. Councilor Hamilton? Present. Good evening. Councilor Henderson? Chain to my screen. <laughs> Councilor Knack is here. Good Live. evening. Uh, Councilor McKean? I managed to find my way to this multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> but did you bring the municipal infinity stone with you is the question. Yeah, I um, wish. Uh, let me check one more time for Councilor Nickel. Councilor Banga? Just made it back. Thank ah, you. Super. Councilor Carmel? Okay, well, 11 ain't bad, so we'll, uh, we'll, that's enough to get started. Uh, we will now turn our attention to the, uh, well, there's two issues. One is, uh, as I um, gave you a heads up, the city manager wants to add a quick verbal on turf maintenance, um, which is timely for us uh, to the agenda, which would be a 6.8 uh, verbal report from the city manager. On what's the title you wanted under? Options to increase mowing cycles. Options to increase mowing cycles. Okay, uh, so it's not a decision a report. Uh, the decisions would come uh, to a future meeting, but there's some <clears throat> interim information here. Can I get a Can I get a motion to move so to add that to the agenda? Thank you, Councillor Second. Henderson. Seconded by um, Councillor Zadek. Okay. Uh, please vote to add the 6.8 options to increase mowing cycles, verbal report. We have 10 online votes. Okay. Um, we've got 10 votes in, we're short two. We've got two absent and we okay. now have 11, thank okay. you. Okay, so we've got 11 present, sorry. Uh, please display the vote. That's carried 11 nothing. So, uh, but we'll deal with that. Um, in order since uh, the uh, role and mandate of Edmonton Salutes was first item for today. Um, so uh, we can, if, if we want the presentation, we can get the presentation or we can go straight into it. Does anyone want the presentation? The consultants are available and on standby for the, for the presentation if you wish. It was an arm's length study done by them. Okay. Uh, well, we've also got the, um, uh, the, the product of their study uh, attached to the report. So, um, Councillor Zadek had selected this. I'll go to you first and see, would you like to hear the presentation or go straight to questions? No, I think the report was comprehensive in its written form. Okay, Any, and so just double check, nobody else wants the presentation. Then, um, Councillor Zadek, I understand you have a motion arising from. Sorry, point of privilege, Mr. Mayor. I just I heard from Councillor Cartmel, who's saying he's not hearing anything. Uh, so he's saying he doesn't have any sound. So that it might have been why he didn't respond. Just to. Okay. I'm not let's, sure he's in the. He is on just, this. Anyway, I just saw I'd flag it. Okay, I'll, let's I'll send him a message. Let's Thanks. pause um, and uh, we'll carry on with Councillor Zadek in a moment. Um, He's chopping WebEx. Oh, there he is. Councillor Cartmel, can you hear us now? Uh, yep, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I was there, but I couldn't hear a thing. Oh, well, glad you could join us. Okay, so we've, uh, we've added the turf uh, report, and um, 
We're just getting started on 6.6 Edmonton Salutes. We've determined we don't uh, need to hear the presentation. The written report speaks for itself, so Councillor Zadick has the floor and I think is going to make a motion. So go ahead, Councillor Zadick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move that, that administration work with Edmonton Salutes to prepare amendments to bylaw 16675 Edmonton Salutes Committee bylaw to continue Edmonton Salutes as a council committee in general alignment with section 7.1 of attachment one of the June 22, 2020 communications and engagement report, CR 7848. Someone want to second that? Second. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Okay, um, go ahead with comments or questions. I have none. Okay. Um, I'll just pause here. I'm getting a note from Councillor McKean that he says he's here, but the clerk has him muted. We can't unmute councillors. They have to do that themselves. Okay. Um, can you attempt to unmute yourself, Councillor Nichol? Is that a is that a star six situation or if they, it depends how they're voting if they have phoned in yes star six otherwise they need to click on the screen so did you say councillor nickel or councillor mckean uh, councillor nickel says i am here but clerk has me muted so from what we can see there is nobody on the call are you it are is you quite still in the, perhaps he is still in the webex we did hear from him here mr mayor I mean, he was on this call he was on the conference line which is the telephone line and then he unfortunately must have been dropped from the conference line. So if you want, we can try to resend him the link. Okay. <clears throat> if you'd like, I can attempt to lead us on a five minute guided meditation and visualization while we attempt to reconnect everyone. Close your eyes, but not 100%. Let a tiny bit of light in. Focus on the breathing, but don't change your breathing. I'm just kidding. I'm not actually going to do that. I was with you. <laughs> Is that rainstorm, windstorm earlier, a south side phenomenon, or did everybody experience it? No, we're all we're all in it together. It passed across the whole city. That's no, it didn't hit Ward Six. <clears throat> Are we live right now? We're only talking about a rainstorm, so it's okay. Yes, you are live on the web. We're broadcasting. Yep. All right. I was just curious. I didn't mean to kill the fun. I mean, please continue.
Oh. Councillor Nickel, is that you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, so I think we have everyone online now. Um, <clears throat> so please go, um, oh yes, a request to put to the text of Councillor's Addicts motion in the chat, please. And um, carry on with introducing the motion or a uh, I don't think you had any further, Councillor Zadig. You're you're ready to take questions. Uh, Councillor Essinger was next. Go ahead. Thank you. I just I'm not sure who this is to, but uh, the report talked about a regional committee, our standalone committee, and a city council committee. And in page 37, it says city council committees are tended to focus internally to city of Edmonton matter. So I wasn't sure why we're selecting city council over a regional standalone. I'll tackle that if I may, councillor, it's Katrin. Um, our focus at this point is to get the committee to a higher level of effectiveness and functionality and feel that it's less about where this, the committee resides and more about its uh, refresh as a more effective entity. So is the hope that in the future it could become a regional committee? That is something that a more, uh, a more highly functioning committee could certainly discuss at a point when it seems suitable to them. Okay, because it seems like it had more weight than in the region. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Um, <clears throat> so the wording, uh, which isn't in the chat yet, I see, but is that administration work with Edmonton Salutes to prepare amendments to bylaw 16675 Edmonton Salutes Committee bylaw to continue Edmonton Salutes as a council committee in general alignment with section 7.1 of attachment one of the June 22nd, 2020 communications and engagement report CR7848. So that is the uh, work that would happen next. Any other questions? Not seeing any, anyone wishing to speak oh, to the motion? Mr. Mayor, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Councillor Katarina. Um, I know to the mover or to uh, administration uh, have all the previous issues uh, issues uh, been resolved that we uh, had spoken about uh, some time ago. Councillor Katarina, the answer to that question is yes. Our focus in this study that was conducted by the consultant was on looking at how to make the committee governance and operations and budgeting and planning more effective. And we believe that will alleviate previous tensions. Oh, okay, so they've been resolved. Indeed. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Don, just uh, as a note, uh, I, I can't hear you when you're speaking. Is this better? That's, That's much better, better, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll try to find the right range from the microphone. Yeah, just get closer to it. Okay. Let's <laughs> see what I can do. My workspace is... Uh, I'm going to do a point of privilege here pretty quick, but first I'd have to get these 
pop cans and uh, empties away from me. <laughs> They're cluttering up my space. It's, it's really going downhill here. Okay, um, any further questions? Comments? I have a quick comment, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Walters, go ahead. Uh, and because I see the consultants here and the report was excellent, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for that work. Uh, and thank you to Ms. Owen for uh, facilitating that work. Uh, I think this puts to loose, which I agree with Councillor Essinger is ultimately a regional committee, but a basis of, of uh, good competency and strength, uh, as it's now suggested, is a wide uh, pathway, I'd say. So thanks to them. And again, thanks to uh, the folks that worked on it. That's all. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, thank you yeah. to the consultants for, uh, for the look. That's helpful. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, now I'm in the right uh, now I'm in the right chat again. Okay, anybody else before I go to Councillor Zadig to close? Councillor Zadig, any closing thoughts? I, I just hope everyone would support this uh, motion. I think that the Salutes Committee will be on the path to success uh, with the the guidance of the consultants' report and whatever ongoing uh, support is required from administration to to really fulfill the mandate of the salutes committee um i'm pretty optimistic about its future so thanks to everyone who's been a part of this thank you councillor um please vote yes We have 13 votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. That's carried unanimously. Okay, next is 6-8, um, the uh, verbal report. Uh, Mr. Lachlan, go ahead. So we do have a quick presentation, if we could uh, get that up on the, the screen. Great. Um, so we're here to present information to Council regarding turf maintenance. Gord Seabrick will be taking us through that presentation. We've prepared this verbal report to respond to Council's motion passed last week, uh, provide some history, background on maintenance, and walk you through adjustments that administration has taken, uh, as well as an option for additional enhancements that could be implemented. And I'll turn it over to Gord for more detail. Thanks, Adam. Uh, good evening, Your Worship, uh, members of Council. As part of the supplementary operating budget, service levels were reduced for maintenance in parks, sports fields, and trails this season. The city then experienced further financial impacts due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which necessitated changes to staffing and service levels. More specifically, the impact operations was felt by making the difficult decision to reduce our seasonal staffing complement for the 2020 summer season. This resulted in us not achieving the 2020 SOBA service levels, due mainly to the workforce strategy, which was approved by ELT, and that focused on meeting Alberta Health Services regulations and the city's financial position. We worked through labor relations approach to redeployment, ensuring that we honored union agreements and remained fiscally responsible while making prudent decisions for service. Staff who were temporarily laid off were given the opportunity to be redeployed to seasonal positions across operations. In turf operations, although we were able to successfully redeploy 40 staff in addition to internal allocations of 57 for a total of 97 staff, this fell significantly short of the 198 headcount requirement needed to carry out the full scope of this budgeted work. We did not recall any seasonal summer workers as a cost-saving measure, which resulted in labor constraints and an inability for us to attain our SOBA budgeted service levels. This season so far, city crews have focused on mowing turf in high profile and highly used areas. Premier parks and sports fields continue to be maintained to regular standards being mowed up to twice a week with a reduction in trimming. Other areas, such as regular sports parks, city or district parks, and business areas are experiencing a reduction or suspension of maintenance for the season, with mowing cycles up to 21 days, as compared to once a week or once every two weeks, and also redu saw reductions in trimming as well. To achieve the minimum 21-day cycles with staffing limitations, 
Areas that were identified for service suspension or substantial reduction this year included pocket parks and municipal reserves with less than 0.5 hectares of turf, as well as passive parkland areas, roadways, utility corridors, and rights of way, as well as stormwater management facilities, dry ponds, and walkways. With these adjusted maintenance cycles, warm and rainy weather at the start of the growing season exasperated the condition of long grass and increased weeds. This has led to frustration from residents as they try to navigate their own new realities this summer while spending more time outdoors in their neighborhoods as a result of COVID. Our lower than anticipated turf maintenance levels have resulted in an increase in 311 notifications from citizens, specifically related to natural areas, horticulture, turf, weeds, and sports fields. We have observed increases of about 140% compared to last year, week over week and year over year. Feedback and concerns have centered around the appearance of open spaces, the length of grass and the presence of dandelions and other weeds. In particular, the decision to stop mowing some locations has entirely has, entirely has led to frustration for many citizens and communities. We have heard the frustration from the public about turf maintenance and the appearance of our green spaces. Based on this feedback and through proactive monitoring of our financial position, we are making adjustments to improve our turf maintenance service levels. Starting early in July, all turf will receive maintenance on a minimum of a 14 day mowing cycle. Premier sports fields and parks will continue to receive twice weekly mowing all turf inventory will receive one cycle of trimming around trees and objects per year and our regular standard for weed control. After reviewing our current budget allocation, we determined that we could responsibly accommodate this service level within the approved SOBA. We are immediately recalling 100 seasonal staff in order to deliver this level. This approach allows for a consistent service that ensures a reasonable level of maintenance across all turf types while staying within our existing budget. It will take some time for crews to catch up on the deferred maintenance. However, Edmontonians should notice an increase in the mowing activity beginning in July. We are hopeful that these adjusted service levels will help alleviate their concerns as we continue to deliver our services with a significantly reduced workforce. With the adjusted level of service I just talked about, I'd like to note that it is still a reduction in maintenance or service level as compared to previous years. However, there is an option to return to full service levels should council choose to do so. This would require an additional $1.8 million to execute, of which 1.3 million is required for personnel. This option would accelerate the mowing cycle for regular sports fields and district parks to a seven day cycle. All other inventory, including neighborhood parks, would be maintained on a 10 to 14 day cycle. This would require a total of 350 staff and we would be able to commence these service levels late in July. Should council wish to proceed with this service level, council would need to provide a motion as we do not have the approved budget. If motion, we will return with funding options as part of the COVID-19 financial impacts and funding strategy update report at the July 6th, 2020 council meeting. I'll now pass it back to Adam. Thanks, Gord. We want to thank Edmontonians for their understanding, patience, and willingness to help as we navigate service changes during times of fiscal restraint. We've taken steps to action the enhanced service levels, as Gord has mentioned, um, considering our, financial, our fiscal reality, the impacts of COVID, and the expectations of our public. As Gord mentioned, should Council wish to see the pre-COVID service levels, we would need a motion from Council and this would be considered as part of the July 6th budget update report. I will flag that at this point in time, the recommended available funding source uh, would have to be the FSR if there weren't any other adjustments. Thanks, and we're happy to take any questions that you have. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> requests to speak on this one? There's a number that are in MMSX. Oh, okay. Mr. Yeah, my situation's not up to updating very well on my device here but uh, I see um, Councillor Katarina and then Councillor Essinger then Councillor Knack or is 
Uh, I'm not sure which order to work from. They're there. all in MMSX okay. for you already Councilor, populated. Councillor Essinger, go ahead. Uh, I think Councillor Katerina was ahead of me, so I would defer and then go. Okay, Councillor Katerina, then Councillor Essinger. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Adam uh, Gord, for uh, for that. So, uh, is legal in the room? They are on the uh, online. Okay, virtual room. So, um, can you speak to uh, the uh, liability issue in that? I know we've had uh, many people ask if they could help, and uh, some have uh, uh, already. Uh, but uh, if we can get a, a clarification on uh, uh, citizens actually doing that work and uh, where, where we stand on it, uh, my position has always been from legal that uh, it is a liability and we discourage them from doing it. So I just, if you could quickly answer that. Uh, Councillor Katerina, it looks like we've lost our, our legal folks, but the answer to your question is yes. There is a liability if we have um, um, citizens mowing, um, and and that's related to the risk associated with being on city city land. Okay, so in saying that, uh, and I understand that uh, the questions come up now. So if that's the case, why do we require private citizens to cut the boulevards next to city sidewalks in front of their homes? Where's the liability there? Because it is city property. And, and please make the distinction for me from a liability issue. Uh, cutting on city property, cutting grass on city property is cutting grass on city property. Um, thanks, Councillor Caterini. I'm going to try and get our legal folks back on so that they can provide an answer that uh, um, I don't incorrectly provide advice on. Okay. And... Um, so I, I can leave that uh, for now, Mr. Mayor, and get an answer when it's available. Thank you. Because uh, I have no other questions. Okay. Councillor Essinger. Thank you. Um, I just have a question on the pocket parks. If I understood correctly, Mr. Seabrook, uh, we weren't going to be doing them this year at all in the previous um, work well, we will do it every 14 days going forward. Is Am I understanding that correctly? That's correct, Councillor Esslinger. Okay, because some of them have reported that there's been a ring around them. Uh, someone has mowed one ring, but the, so they were unclear what that was about. So on, on many locations, what we had done uh, was just do the outer edge, and basically that was uh, with the intention of preparing for winter operations. So... Uh, that the turf would be uh, lower when we do uh, our winter uh, snow and ice control. But that was the only mowing that was taking place uh, on those locations that were uh, being passed up this year. Okay. And I appreciate that we've been under financial constraint, um, but certainly this has resonated with um, the community and they're quite upset. I do have a question. I don't really know who should answer this, but someone asked me a great question. They said, if the city isn't going to mow our, our weeds, why are we getting weed notices to mow ours? Are we still ticketing folks for not mowing their weeds? Uh, Councillor, I think this year we've tried to be um, uh, more of an um, uh, ambassador on, on many different fronts uh, with, uh, with the, the um, enforcement components. So. We've tried to take the approach of um, working with people and, and recognizing the, the current state that everybody is in. Uh, and perhaps um, I can get a little bit more background from Mr. Aitken, but uh, that was the intent uh, of our philosophy in terms of working with citizens. Okay, because I had someone call, they got a notice about what, one of their rental properties while complaining about our own leading. So I, I think we're getting a mixed message, but I appreciate if. We're trying to take a softer approach, which make more sense. Um, I think that's all my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for the information and for your willingness to look into that, find a way to make that work even, even without any separate budget adjustments. So I, I know it doesn't get up to the main level, the full level, but that's a, a big change from where it was before. 
Uh, a few questions. So one just related to the sports fields, and I don't know for sure. I think there's been still some mixed messages around if, if any leagues are going to try anything uh, to do any type of organized sports. But I'm curious if there is um, a push forward to do that, would that affect how we would look at the other sports fields other than the premier ones? So I think we would we would try to be agile as we have been, and again, this is a baseline to start with, knowing that uh, the situation is very dynamic, and I think we would just continue to monitor our financial position and our resourcing, and and depending on what the user groups do, we would uh, certainly look at trying to work with them as best we could. That makes sense. Okay, great. Uh, I wanted to ask, there's been uh, some suggestions and I think there's been some, some tweets that have been sent out and a lot of us have been attached around um, what we might do, and this is probably less of a today conversation, but, but I am interested, and I think Councillor Paquette even did a motion on it a while back, but looking at the boulevards and looking at things like wildflowers, things that require less maintenance uh, and, and allow us to then focus on other areas, is there any work underway on that? So we have had a body of work, of course, uh, uh, you're probably familiar with the, um, the naturalized areas and I think uh, the whole process around the pandemic and, and the way we're looking at reimagining, I think everything is, is worth considering going forward and those are pieces uh, on, on the future of, of how we maintain all of our, our natural spaces that we're going to consider. So we're doing that body of work at a, and that's great. Okay, good. good. And, and I mean, it, I imagine this will be if it's being part of the reimagine work, we'll engage with the different organizations because we've got groups who have said, you know, boy, we'll, we'll do the work and, and get in these wildflowers and do all these different things. I'm not a gardener, so I'm the wrong person to ask about any of this, but uh, we would do some engagement with those groups who do have that talent. <laughs> Correct, and we've seen some really good uptake in some of the existing programs. We have, for example, the Root for Trees program, yeah. so we know that there is uh, a lot of interest in supporting uh, the, uh, the ecosystem that we have in the city. Great. Um, and then just, uh, Mr. Lachlan, when you talked about the return to full service, again, if, if we were tapping, if we decided to spend that, is that 1.8 million, I might have misheard, is that total or is that per month for? That is uh, over what we're projecting for the remainder of the summer season. For the so remainder of the summer season. Over July, August, and September. Okay. But if we were going to tap into that, we'll also part of that July 6 conversation would also be saying, if we were willing to tap into FSR, that might not be the number one priority. It might be, you know, enhancing transit service to the areas without it. We'll debate that then, right? So we'll have a sort of prioritization list of the 125 areas that have been. I'm not asking you to prioritize 125, but I mean, there might be, you know, five or six things that council would want to debate if we were truly going to tap into that fund. Correct. I would just flag that we're typically not doing budget exercises mid-year, but if no. certainly if there's pressures that need to be addressed, that's an opportunity and we'll give you um, a projection of where we're at yeah. and, and, and um, an opportunity to discuss service levels, yes. And that would also, though, include any, because when we made the budget at the end of April, that was projecting out a, a shortfall through to mid-September, and now, now we have new information. We may want to have the FSR available for anything beyond that point, too, so we'll have more of that information, almost like a, this is a mini supplemental adjustment come July 6th. Um. I'm cautious to call it yeah, a mini supplemental, it but no, yeah. <laughs> an opportunity to talk about um, specific uh, concerns that council has mm -hmm. and advice on how we could potentially budget for that. I will flag that a motion is required um, to do that, and I believe it does need some notice as well. So That's fair. Thank you very much. Appreciate this. So just to be clear, what you're bringing to us here today is um, information about what the service level you're able to meet within the budget, which is a little bit higher than what people have been seeing, but not what we normally do. Um, that's within your delegated authority. We would be simply receiving that for information here today. Additional options if we wish to go um, either by degrees or fully back to typical service level, that will be before us uh, in a couple of weeks. Correct. Okay. Um, so the only motion today is receipt of information. Um, <clears throat> uh, debating the service level will come in, uh, in July unless there's a motion to do something 
uh, which was not the intent for today's update because we don't have the pricing on that just yet. Uh, so that would be before you at a future meeting. But this is interim update of what's possible. So I've got Councillor Banga, then Councillor Zadig, then Councillor Paquette. Councillor Banga, go ahead. Thank you very much. So uh, could you please clarify for me what is a slightly adjusted level of uh, service? And that is uh, that can be addressed without any budget adjustments. So, uh, Councillor, uh, we um, basically are indicating that we had levels of service that were identified within uh, the uh, the SOBA, and that's what we're able to achieve now by adding the additional staff. We weren't able to reach that target prior to. Um, this discussion, uh, but we have committed to uh, moving to the uh, seven-day MO cycle on the uh, premier sports fields, the 14-day MO cycle on the sports uh, fields and district parks, as well as uh, reducing down to a 14-day MO cycle on uh, multi-use pathways, boulevards, uh, and stormwater management facilities, as well as pocket parks. So some of those locations were um, on a 21-day cycle and others were um, not getting mowed at all this year. So we were able to adjust our frequency to those projected uh, targets. Okay, and uh, in your estimation, that $1.8 million figure that is a probably a pretty good estimate in your mind, and that would uh, bring us back to the the full service model. That would give us uh, the resources to deliver the service at the same level or similar level to, to uh, 2019. Okay, and then uh, to do that or to bring that exact figure, do we have to make a motion today or are you gonna bring it back automatically? So today what we're presenting is information in terms of what we're doing as administration within our authority. If council wants an enhanced level of service, there would have to be a motion, and then that would be discussed at July 6th uh, as part of the budget update. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I would uh, like to make that motion when the time is right. And uh, Sorry, Councillor, uh, yeah. receipt of information today or to increase the service levels? Increase the service levels. Okay. Um, there will be some sort of lineup and mad scramble for that opportunity at the council meeting where the information with the with the, essentially the service package comes back to. So that would not be in order today, but if you'd like to move receipt of information of this information, that would be fine. Okay. Well, I just want uh, this thing done. It doesn't matter how it gets done. And my other question Well, it, it uh, does is, because you need a funding source and, and yeah. it needs to be in the form of a budget amendment and, and the time for that will be at the July 6th council meeting. Yeah. Uh, Second. Yeah, just to clarify. Uh, um, Sorry, Councillor Zadek, were you seconding receipt of information or indicating uh, a desire uh, to uh, second a motion that uh, isn't before us right now? No, Mr. Mayor. Receipt of information. Okay. Thank you. Um, do I still have a few seconds left there? Yes, you do. Mr. Mayor? Okay. So, uh, Mr. Seabrick, I know uh, you are saying that uh, there would be 100 more people, seasonal stuff, uh, recalling. Uh, they, they will be recalled. Even if we, let's say, make that decision today, do we have enough time to make a difference uh, this summer? So... Just to be clear, there are a hundred staff that are being recalled uh, within uh, our budget and our delegated authority. The additional hundred and fifty would uh, would commence as soon as we had the budget approval. Uh, it would there would be a, a bit of a ramp up, but certainly um, we would try to to move as quickly as possible if that was the direction provided by council, knowing full well that there is a bit of a ramp up period. Uh, we would still, you would citizens would still see a a, a difference, but uh, again, it would take some time to ramp up. Okay, so um, and once you recall everybody, how how long it takes to basically give them their jobs back? 
That happens very quickly. Uh, if we're recalling staff that were previously uh, working in those areas, they would already have the necessary training and the majority of the skill set. So uh, it, there would be the uh, regular onboarding and it would happen fairly quickly. Um, we anticipate the, uh, the process for the current 100 um, that we will have a large percentage of them back early next week. Okay. So with this uh, CERB, that there, some of them are receiving from, from the federal government. Are they going to all come back? It's really tough to answer that question, Councillor Benga. We can't speak to the likelihood of individuals in terms of their personal situation. Um, what we would do is uh, do our best to get enough individuals back to provide the service. Thank you very much. My time must be up. Yes. Uh, any further questions? <coughs> okay. Uh, law is available now to offer a uh, response to uh, Councillor Katarina's earlier question. Uh, does administration or does legal have the question, or would you like it restated? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would appreciate if the question could be restated. It's Nancy Thank Jacobson you. from Legal Services. Hi, Nancy. Uh, um, Councilor okay. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I can restate it. Or, or Adam, uh, do you want to you want to restate what maybe you need clarification on yourself? So the question is um, liability associated with pocket parks or other park mowing versus mowing the boulevard in front of one's house and the expectation that citizens have to mow that versus the liability associated with mowing in other city lands. Nancy, if you could respond to that, then if, if, if it needs more detailed counsel, we can follow up with a memo and make sure it's clear for all of you uh, in paper. Definitely, a memo would likely help to provide the details, but the high level overview here is that uh, there are gonna be some different oh &S obligations that will apply in our parks because they are lands that the city is maintaining and responsible for. So we would have to look at training, supervision, and personal protective equipment. The boulevards are a bit different because of course there is an obligation already on property owners to cut the grass on that property. So it is a different standard that would be held to, which is why we can't promote residents mowing of the city owned park infrastructure. But as Adam indicated, we can certainly follow up with a very detailed memo to help explain that distinction if that would help. Well, uh, maybe just an understanding. I mean, it would help me certainly uh, explaining to those who have asked these questions uh, and why the difference in liability uh, on city-owned land uh, and why the standards would be different as far as training and PPE and, and those sorts of things. Um, very hard to explain to people why they can't do it and then why they are required to do it on city property. And we can provide um, information to each of you to help with that explanation. And if uh, there's more discussion required, uh, we'll, we'll have multiple opportunities at the upcoming council <coughs> meetings that we have, Councillor Katarina. Okay, that, that's uh, satisfactory uh, to me. Uh, and uh, just to state it again, uh, Mr. Lachlan uh, and legal, you are not recommending that we encourage citizens to mow the parks. We do not that is encourage, correct. We do not encourage citizens to mow the parks. And you would like us to follow suit? That is correct. And our hope is that with this additional level of service that will be provided based on the adjustments that we're making with our operations that we'll, we'll start to um, address some of the concerns that have been raised. And as has been discussed on July 6th, if there's a desire um, <coughs> to enhance that even further with the limited funds or shall I say no funds that we have, um, that is certainly council's purview. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Lachlan. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Zadek. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you to administration for the quick turnaround on this. And that's that's the main thing I wanted to say because um, the, my other questions have been asked. But but there is another area that I just want to venture into, which, which I hope is still on topic. And that can be uh, 
stopped if, if required, but just with litter in parks and with garbage cans being overflown, uh, filled up, is with this increase, uh, potentially the potential increased money for turf maintenance, does that factor in garbage removal in our park sites? Uh, Councillor Zydek, it, it's not directly, but certainly um, when our, our uh, uh, teams are out there doing turf maintenance, they also will, will pick up uh, and, and try and keep the site as clean as possible. So, the, you know, the more, more times they're out there, the, certainly there's more opportunity to pick up more of the litter. We have uh, actually had our parks teams working with uh, our waste management uh, group to see if there's some capacity to free up a little bit better uh, litter pickup. So they are working at integrating on, on that. So we're hoping that that has an impact as well. Thank you, that's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions? Councilor yes, please, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Councilor Zadek. Uh, that was a big part of what I was going to ask. Um, obviously, anyone who's seen uh, these areas knows that, that uh, there's enormous amounts of litter trapped in that long grass. So that's something we're going to have to be cognizant of. So um, obviously, this is a way to save money. Um, but I'm just wondering um, if... Uh, if we've been getting, th I know we have in, in our offices, but I'm just wondering if it's been uh, coming through 311 loud and clear that um, something that seems to be very important for people's mental health is to have communities that look clean or tidy that they can be proud of. And I'm just wondering if that message got through to administration as well. Yes, it has. That's why we've gone ahead and made the adjustments related to the mowing frequency within the budget constraints that we have. Right, because on paper it makes sense, you know, a little bit of reduced maintenance and everyone saves money and one of the priorities of people is, is uh, you know, paying less tax. So that was uh, for some people. And so that was uh, that effort to uh, keep our budget in line, which I understand. Um, looking at the bigger picture though, Councillor Knack did raise uh, the issue that I raised, uh, you know, and Gord, you'll remember this a little over a year ago about um, possibly naturalizing in a very beautiful way um, some of our boulevards and, and uh, small turf areas with uh, indigenous permaculture, like meaning indigenous plants, um, with fruit trees and bushes and nut trees and things like that. And I'm just wondering um, if that's something we're moving toward or do, would we actually need a motion to start exploring that more seriously. Uh, Councillor Paquette, I think uh, I alluded to that a little earlier with uh, Councillor Knack's uh, question in terms of uh, what the options are going forward. And as part of the reimagine work, uh, that's certainly what we want to look at is where we have options for things like increasing our naturalized areas, uh, looking at different ways of um, using those naturalized areas in terms of the the types of plants that we plant in there. But I think the other part is that we would want to probably look at some options that uh, align more with what citizens are, are looking for. So we would want to do some engagement as part of that exercise as well. So would we also want to explore uh, what Councillor Caterina was raising about liability issues? Because this would invite the public to sort of engage in these spaces. It would save us money, but it would also mean that more people are using them. Is that something we would want to discourage or encourage? Councillor, that's hypothetical and not really right. for us right now. So um, I think I'm just thinking in terms of saving money and turf maintenance. And, and, you know, we got in this situation with cutting grass. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we just want to save money and have a beautiful space for our neighborhoods. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, all fair questions, just a, a little beyond the, the scope of the operational update for today. So um, I'm just overly eager. I, Thank I, you. I, I recognize that. I salute that. And I want to go home. So sorry, I'm, I'm not at this hour. But <laughs> but uh, that's my own uh, that, that's my own problem. So, um, uh, OK, any other burning questions on the operating update to the turf service levels within the approved budgets? 
we will have a further conversation about this soon uh, in the context of budget adjustments and available resources and all service levels in context July 6. Okay, so the motion to receive for information is before us uh, with gratitude that you're able to do a little bit more within uh, the scarce resources that we have. Thank you for the update. Um, uh, anyone wishing to speak? Mr. Mayor. Uh, Go ahead, Councillor Banga. This would yeah, be, this would be, know, to, clo this would be it, to close. It, yeah, uh, I ahead. mean, it's encouraging to hear uh, uh, that uh, administration is uh, doing their best to address the concerns. And uh, I have heard so many complaints. Uh, I don't know the other words in the interior of the city, but in the exterior parts of the city, there it is looking ridiculous. And uh, one way or the other, I just want to make sure that um, when people are living in those areas, whether it's their mental health, physical health, I think this is the least we could do. So uh, we'll do more uh, discussion on uh, July 6th. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Um... No, that was to close. Okay, please vote. Yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm uh, out of chronic here. We have th th uh, the required votes. Please display the required votes, which are unanimous in their desire to receive this information, which is good news. So thank you for bringing it on an urgent basis. More discussion on turf and edible boulevards to follow. Um, are there any other uh, notices of motion? Seeing none, then uh, until tomorrow when we resume a different meeting at 9.30 in the morning, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Uh, have a good night. See you tomorrow.